All right. Um, no, share tab. All right. Hopefully, Lord have mercy. Let me zoom in some more. Okay. Can everyone see my screen and also hear me? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm curious. Um, because I don't oh want my gosh. To. Do not. Hopefully the YouTube is still live as well. <laughs> All right. So we are going to start from the beginning. I am using my spreadsheet that sort of helped me keep everything in one place. Um, I wouldn't say that it's for everyone just because not everyone is good at using spreadsheets but for me like i like it because i can just go to different tabs and find definitions i can see like progress of how i'm doing when i check off like what chapters that i've done and what i feel good about what i don't feel good about so i can kind of get an idea of where i'm at in terms of like competency with this sheet so this is one of the tabs that i actually made this is not included in the um study guide that I sell, but this is like, this is the basic study guide that I sell, but it has an extra tab, which is the one that I'm on right now. It says terms and definitions, ABC order. I put this in there because I wanted to be able to find terms really quickly. Um, but on the other tabs, you can fill in the definitions and sort of learn as you go. But I do have like a quick reference sheet for myself when I'm doing meetings and stuff. So this is what I'm going to be using today for a couple of the task items. Um, so yeah, we'll start with philosophical underpinnings, which is part of foundations. A1, identify the goals of behavior analysis as a science. We know that that means description, prediction, and control. So hopefully that rung a bell to you before you even really read the whole thing. Um, Description is the systematic observation of a given phenomena leading to prediction after repeated observations of events that co-vary or seem correlated. And lastly, with a certain degree of confidence, a functional relationship is established with ability to exercise control. So you sort of start at description and work your way to control. Control is what we typically would want to get like it, it, anytime that we're trying to fix the behavior or change the behavior we want to figure out the functional relations of that behavior and so we want to be able to describe it and we want to be able to make a prediction based on the past and the pattern of the person behaving or the behavior itself and then we want to be able to control it with the interventions that we put into place so that's a1 does anyone have questions about a1 or want to add anything Welcome everyone that's just getting here. We just did A1. Let me go to my tab. Where is it at? Here it is. All right. A2. Explain the philosophical assumptions underlying the science of behavior analysis. All right, so when you think of philosophical assumptions, go ahead and think of the acronym that's going to help you i made an acronym read pp so well i didn't really make it because others have used it too but this is the one that i like to use um the first one i'll say is replication which means repeating experiments we want to do this for believability we want to see it over and over so that we know that it's reliable and we want to know that it's believable experimentation which is the basic strategy for measurement of the phenomenon of interest with carefully controlled comparison. We're basing this all around a dependent variable and we're using the independent variable to change the dependent variable or alter or get them to do what we want them to do. The client, the client is the dependent variable and then what we put into place is the independent variable. So if you're having trouble remembering client as dependent variable and then 
independent variable as what we're doing. Think of it as like independent I change, independent I change, right? And the dependent variable, it, the client is, how the client acts depends on what we change or what we do. So. So the client's always the dependent variable? Always. Okay. Because always. that's what we're manipulating, right? We're manipulating that to get a change, right? Exactly. Okay. Um, and so if you're having trouble still with like the independent variable, independent variable, if you look at any graph and you see the client and then you see the intervention on the graph, the intervention is always going to be on the bottom line or also the X axis. The X axis is the line going across, right? So the intervention is going to be on the bottom always. The dependent variable or the client is going to be on the Y axis, which is going up. So Y to the sky, client, dependent variable, that's always going to be on the Y axis. So if a question asks you, which I have been asked this before, not on the exam, but I'm a, I'm a first time test taker, but I've seen mock exams where it said, identify the dependent variable and it had all these different things labeled. And the dependent variable is always going to be on the y-axis. That's a, just like an automatic giveaway question for me because I know for a fact that's where I'm going to find it at. So that's a little bit, I know I kind of went on a tangent for that, but some people have trouble remembering it. And I think it's like one of those questions that like could be an easy, an easy point for you. So just try to remember those things. Yeah, that was huge helpful because I always have problems with the graphs. That was like so helpful. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, and I mean, another way to remember the X axis, X across. So like how you draw an X is across, like it's going to go across the bottom. So you know for a fact it's an X if it's going across, right? And then you know for a fact that Y, Y to the sky is going to go up. Mm -hmm. And that's always going to be going up on the side, and that's going to be your client or your dependent variable on that. You'll also notice the x-axis is typically in time. Not always, but a lot of the time, the, the x-axis is going to be in time, and then the, the y-axis is going to be whatever the level or rate of the behavior or the whatever the person is doing is going to be on the y, and then the time is going to be on the bottom or whenever the intervention was like on a multiple baseline design, you're going to see the intervention on the bottom and you're going to see the different times that the intervention was implemented based on the client or the setting or the behavior. So that's a good example of a graph that would show like the differences in time and implementation. So moving on to, let's see, we did R, we did E, which is uh, replication and experimentation. Now the other E, which is empiricism, which is the practice of objective op, objective observation, um, you know, looking at looking at whatever you're looking at, but you're looking at it within a very objective lens. You're not just putting random stuff. Like, what do you see? Are you being objective? Like, are you accurately documenting what you see and what you're experiencing? Um, it's very evidence based and scientific. So think about that. Like, empiricism is very evidence based, and it's going to be very like as a matter of fact. Um, determinism, which is nothing is an accident. Uh, the universe is a lawful and orderly place. So nothing is just gonna like come out of the blue or just be random, like if it's for a reason. Is, um, can we say that's almost like you're provoking something to happen? Or what do you mean? Like your actions is gonna cause something to happen, like, if you make the wrong choice, you're causing it to to happen. Can we put it that way? Um, you know, if that's how you're going to remember it, that mm -hmm. that's fine. I think it's good to sort of make your own like mm -hmm. sort of takeaway from it. But okay. as long as you remember that, like nothing is accident. Yeah, that's because I was having a hard time remembering this. So I was like, okay, it's like me provoking my own incident to happen. You know, my own actions causes it to fail or causes it to break or whatever it's supposed to be. That's how exactly. I'm remembering. Yeah. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. uh, my desk didn't just break out of nowhere. I was pushing on it. Yeah. Like that. That's what I mean. Like our yeah. actions 
will cause something to happen. Exactly. Yes. Very okay. Good. Does anyone else need any help with that determinism? All right, uh, parsimony, ruling out simple and logical explanations first. So start simple. It's easy to remember this one. Start simple and then work your way to complex. You don't have to go the full nine yards when you're trying to figure out something. Just start simple, start small. And then whatever you have to do, if you can't figure it out at the simple state, then go, you know, think about the other explanations that could be. Um, parsimony, let's see. Parsimony. I don't know actually what the origin of this word is. I know that money means money, <laughs> like in old English, but I don't know like how the parsimony actually like means simple. Does anyone know that? I'm just curious. I think you're right. I think it means simple. Like if I take it as like you're taking baby steps before you get to the grand finale. And then from there you see if it's, that's the way you want to go. That's how I've been yeah. taking it because it's easier for me to remember. Yeah. Or if you're mm -hmm. having trouble remembering like parsimony, like parts, you know, like small, mm -hmm. like small yes. part. Mm -hmm. um, so simple. Or you know what, parsim, you could take the S-I-M, take the S-I-M and just put simple in there. True, that could work, yeah. Yeah, so that's like one way. And now for philosophic doubt, which is pretty simple too. Um, it's just a healthy, a healthy level of skepticism. Uh, it's the idea that scientific knowledge is, should always be viewed as tentative. Like there's not always going to be like that certain, certain thing. Like you can still question it. You could still wonder about it. You could still be curious and see like, hmm, maybe this isn't true. Like maybe this needs more refinement. Whatever that is, you're continuously questioning what's regarded as a fact. That's called philosophic doubt. A3, describe and explain behavior from the perspective of radical behaviorism. All right, so most of us probably recognize radical behaviorism as a theory or phenomenon by B.F. Skinner. Um, the word radical means fundamental root or origin. I just put that in there just because like, it just helps me remember that it's like all encompassing and this can be compared to methodological behaviorism because radical behaviorism considers both private and public events. So both overt and covert um, events for radical behaviorism. Whereas methodological, you're only gonna really be worrying about public events, things that you can see. So methodological is more strict and radical behaviorism is just more all like it's just more open. Like it's gonna be considering both the inner dimensions of the of the person and then also the, the environment and what they what someone could see and document. So BF Skinner didn't think that everything is just about what you can see and that's all to it. Like there's no other variables that are impacting the person rather than what we can see. It's actually something else that could be happening that we can't see, which are covert. Someone in this group gave me a really clever way of remembering covert and overt. When they said covert, like covered, like you can't see it. So covert means like we can't observe it. And then overt is like you can observe. <clears throat> A4. Distinguish among behaviorism, the experimental analysis of behavior, applied behavior analysis, and professional practice guided by the science of behavior analysis. Monsieur, can I ask a question? So, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, so when it comes to those two philosophies, which one are we supposed to focus on? Do we need to worry about which one do we apply? The methodological versus the radical behaviorism? Well, I guess it depends on what you're wanting to study. Uh -huh. Like if 
you're going to work in the field, then I would suspect it's smart to apply the radical uh -huh. behaviorism like perspective, just because you really do want to consider everything, uh -huh. like not just what you can see. Okay. Even though it's like outside of, you know, the realm of behavioral science, if we can't really, you know, see it and measure it, it's still probably a part of the client uh -huh. and what the client's doing. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. But typically though, for the dimensions of ABA, we want to be able to measure it and be able to observe it. That is ideal, yes. But you do still consider other inner dimensions too. You just can't really, you know, put your finger on it and say, oh, I'm going to do this because I think he's feeling sad. Like, we don't really know that. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Also, wait, is this Pam? This is Pam. Okay, good. Did you send, uh, uh, sorry, I thought that you had sent the message to the group saying you need the link. And I was like, wait, I just forgot. And then I was like, wait, that sounds like Pam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you sent it to me already. And I'm, I didn't check my email, but I, I tried to get on it. Oh. I, did, I could not get on it. So I just, I just do my phone. I just thought, you know what? I'm just going to, I, I got on it around 11, about uh, 1045. I said, let me just wait. And for some reason, I just could not get in. I was like, you know what? Let me just click. I use my phone. Okay. Well, do you need the link sent to your email again so you can use the computer or are you good? Yes, if you can do that. But I don't want to disturb the group. You know, I'm fine like this. I don't want to, okay. you know, I know it's a lot for you to go back and forth and back and forth. Okay. Or does, yeah. does anyone else mind just putting it in the, um, in the, um, group chat because I'm kind of <laughs> I don't mind this time if someone sends it out but yeah that'd be nice if no one does it in the next couple of minutes I'll do it I'll okay. try right. I'll try and <laughs> okay. go okay okay thank okay. you guys okay. thank you okay. guys so much okay all right so uh um yes the group chat on Facebook the Google Meet link to the Facebook group chat sorry i should have been more specific thank you Alyssa. all right um a4 so i already read the task list item i like to use beep because it's just an acronym for all four um so beep b-e-a-p beep those are the four categories pretty much of behavior analysis stemming from behaviorism all the way to professional practice which is like the implementation and everything so behaviorism we start at the theory and the philosophy um the theoretical account of all behavior consistent with existing data so the idea of behaviorism is that what people do can be observed and studied that is a very very basic basic idea of behaviorism it's like the 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 building block of EAB, ABA, and professional practice. It's like where it starts at. The theory and philosophy, okay? Then we work our way up to experimental analysis of behavior, which was largely focused on by B.S. Skinner. Also, we have to remember Watson and Pavlov. That's like, earlier research but skinner was one of the major players in eab and he focused on designing testing and reporting findings of lab research such as rate of response as the basic dependent variable again rate of response as a basic dependent variable he was trying to see hold on he was trying to test the rate of response in the rats or the cats or whatever he was doing the dependent variable was, in this case, the rats or, the, or whatever he was doing. So remember, when you're working with a client, they're the dependent variable. Just like Skinner was working in the labs and he was testing rate of response and, you know, just anything. He was testing based on what he did. How did it impact the dependent variable, which was his lab subjects? So with EAB. Skinner focused on designing, testing, and reporting findings of lab research 
such as rate of response as the basic dependent variable, repeated or continuous measurement of clearly defined response classes uh, within, within subject experimental comparisons instead of group designs, uh, visual analysis of graph data instead of statistical inference, and an emphasis on describing functional relations between behavior and controlling variables in the environment over formal theory testing. So he was very hands-on, very, very hands-on, very interested in um, using graphs and like, you know, how we do visual analyses. He did that too. He wanted to show the different rates of responding and the different ways that he could impact the behaviors of his subjects. Um, he wanted to really try to show functional relations between the behavior and then what he was doing, which was the controlling variables. <clears throat> now we move on to the A and the BEEP. We did the B and E, now for the A. The A is called the ABA, which is what we're doing. And it is the technology development and application of behaviorism and EAB principles towards socially significant behaviors to improve an individual's quality of life. So we've taken the first two and we've tied it all into what we're doing, which is the technology development, the application, based on those principles, based on all the things that we've read about in research. We're taking those and we're using them for clients to help, to help them. So we're gonna always try to pick, and I'm gonna get to the dimensions next, but it emphasizes socially significant, right? That's the applied in ABA. So pretty much we move from like the lab and the, the scientific sort of like lab coat. Um, what was I gonna say? We move from like the scientific way of doing things to more like we're in the field, we're working with clients, we're writing the plans, we're teaching the plans, we're doing all those things based on the scientific evidence that has been published and, and taught to us. I think we kind of know about ABA, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on. All right, so now the last letter in BEEP is professional practice guided by the science of behavior analysis. I did use an acronym for that because I didn't wanna retype it out, but hopefully you know what it is. <laughs> um, this is the direct implementation and application. So sometimes as the, the ABA therapist, as the BCBA, we're gonna be doing the professional practice and the implementation. Some people do, some people don't. So don't think just because, you know, you have a BCBA, you won't be doing direct implementation because a lot of people do. Um, some people choose not to, but still, whenever you're directly implementing, you're doing professional practice. For the ABA domain, it's more so focused around the technology development, um, given we're using the application of behaviors in the EAB, whereas professional practice is when you're actually doing it, like you're, you're delivering the service. And a lot of times it's gonna be the RBT, but sometimes it's gonna be us. So, next is A5. This is all about the dimensions. Describe and define the dimensions of applied behavior analysis. Heavily influenced by the Bayer, Wolf, and Risley. If, if, if I don't even, I don't, you know what? Is that even right? Risley, Riley, <laughs> Bayer, Wolf, Risley, uh, 1968, uh, some current dimensions. That is a really, really big staple um, in our field. So if you haven't read it, probably go read it just to have. Um, Get a Cab is an acronym you can use for all the dimensions. There are seven. The first one is generality. This means it lasts over time. Not only lasts over time, but it also appears, appears in other environments that you did not initially implement the intervention at. So not just at home where you taught your kid to push his chair in, but it also, you can also see your kid behave at a restaurant, push their chair in and, you know, be polite and everything. So they're generalizing those things they learned at home in, in other environments. That's generality. Uh, effective. It produces actual behavior change. Some people confuse 
effective and I want to say conceptually systematic. No, I think people can use effective and applied. Yeah, those two are confused because effective means we really want to see that the behavior change was like it worked. It, we what we did worked. Um, it's not necessarily about being, you know, making sure it's socially significant because that's the applied. But like, you want to be able to see that what you did caused a change in the other person. So that's effective. Did it work? That's a question you need to ask yourself. Did what I did work? Technological. The procedure can be replicated and followed by other people. It's teachable. So if I write a plan and I give it to a teacher, but they can't do it, it's not technological because I didn't write it so that someone else could go behind me and do it again. We just wasted time. So whenever you're trying to make something technological and you're trying to base it on that, make sure that it can easily be followed. Even if it's just like you teach it one time and you just see like, oh, were they able to do it? Were they able to understand what I was saying? So making it easy to understand, making it easily understood, like in terms of, can you watch that person do what you just said to do? And did they do it correctly? Applied, socially significant. We know that. Um, and it improves their quality of life. Ranking target behaviors. I've seen so many times that people choose these behavior plans and these target behaviors that don't really even matter that much. Or therapists that choose skills that the client already has. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Why choose target behaviors that the person already has? You're not really improving their quality of life because that they already knew how to do that thing. So why choose that? Um, not to go off on a tangent, but just like sort of how, I mean, I guess use common sense too. Like, should you really be programming someone to set the table when they have trouble even like sitting down and, and like, you know, being at the table calmly and not hitting? Like, is that, is it really more important for them to know how to set a table and do all that before they can actually like sit down at a table and eat normally? Um, I've seen and heard stories about that. So hopefully someone is uh, giving me a me too. Yes, Faye. No, I'm just going to piggyback on what you were saying. And it's mostly, and it's so crazy, it's mostly the insurance companies that mm -hmm. think that we're doing it back. The insurance company think that we're doing it backwards when they, they're not recognizing what we need to do first. Exactly. Just like you said, insurance company will say, oh, they need to learn how to set, set a table. And then we're thinking, no, <laughs> they need to learn how to sit at a table before they can learn how to set a table. Exactly. Yeah, I'm going through that right now with the insurance company. It's like, you know, they don't want us to teach, want me to teach my client how to you know say words you know different words but mm -hmm. it's like he if he's out in the community he's going to need to know how to respond to different um scenarios and stuff like that but they don't think that that's important that's crazy <laughs> it is well so i mean i'm sure all of us will see that and be like frustrated because we're trying to go based on the dimensions we're trying to go based on our roots and then they come along and they're just like, no, like you're gonna do what I say because we're we're paying. So no, like there's always gonna be that you know hard situation where we just gotta like figure out what to do, what's the best choice to make in a situation like that. Um, but I I do know I'd like to add that um, I inquired on who who is the insurance? Um, are they BCBAs? Do they actually know the role of the ones writing the interventions and they are BCBAs. They have doctorates that who, that is who um, approves um, the, the intervention. 
So it's kind of like, wow, if someone that's sitting there that has a PhD and has the BCBA and they want to see, you know, improvement, it's kind of hard to argue that. Yeah, it's really, it's tough. All right. So where was I? Okay. So that, that, that concludes uh, section one, which is a one through five. That's section one, excuse me. Task list item one, which is can A. You, can you go back over conception, conceptional um, systematic? Did I skip that? Oh, you know what? Yeah. Yeah, I did. I, I, you know applied. what? That's right. Because I we started talking about it and I totally forgot. Yes. Yeah. So apply socially significant, <laughs> conceptually systematic. Uh, the interventions used must improve the behavior and they need to be based on relevant principles of behavior analysis. If what you're doing is not evidence-based, if what you're doing is not based on behaviorism or relevant principles, it is not conceptually systematic. Concept. Think about the concepts, the concepts that we learn. If you're having trouble with that, that term, just think about the word concept. What concepts did you learn in your program based in ABA can you use for this client? Are they known to work? Are they known to have certain drawbacks? Are there pros? Are there cons? Think about all of that. That is evidence-based interventions that you need to use. If you learn them in your ABA program, most likely they're conceptually systematic and you need to go ahead and use the ones that are known to work. And that's why you should be good with looking up literature um, because you need to be able to find interventions that maybe you didn't learn about. Maybe you're trying to figure out something else. You can't figure out why the client is not responding to you when you're doing all these different things. Like there might be times where you do need to look up other interventions that you might not know about. And that's where literature comes into place for that. Um, Java is great. Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis. They have a lot of good articles. All right. Analytic. The experimenter demonstrated a functional relationship between manipulated events and a reliable change in the target behavior. So analytic, functional relationship. You want to see that there was a change. There was a manipulation in the environment from either the therapist, either the whatever, whatever was changed. You want to be able to see the relationship between what was changed in the environment and what changed in the client of the dependent variable. Is it reliable? Is it just a, a, a confound or was what you did, in fact, if what you did, in fact, uh, impacted the client? We want to be able to see that, put it in a graph, be able to look at it and see. Um, so that's that. Let's see, behavioral, last one in the get a cap acronym, behavioral. The behavior must be observable, measurable, and the behavior studied must be the behavior we want to change. When the behavior changes, we must check who changed their behavior, which we must check who changed their behavior, the subject, the observer, or another participant's behavior. So that is actually a really good point because I was wondering one time, like, I wonder why did this kid's behavior change? Was it me who changed? Was it them who changed? Who really caused a change in this in this child? And so sometimes it's really not about changing the kid necessarily, but sometimes it's as simple as changing ourselves and the way that we do things. Like I know for an example, and I'm not going to go off on a tangent, but like I realized that I was the problem um in a classroom when i was dealing with a really challenging kid and i realized that i wasn't talking with a nice tone and then i realized when i changed my tone he did everything and i was just like wow okay so it was me it was the way i was delivering my message he didn't like it and so he was fighting back because he wanted like a softer slower calmer you know approach and I didn't, and that's not how I wanted to communicate because I was already a little bit frustrated. But really, sometimes you have to take a step back and say, like, is it me who needs to change my behavior? Or, like, whose problem is it? Like, who needs to do what? It's not always about the client, the client, the client. He's doing this, he's doing that. Like, what are the people around him doing? What are they, 
How are they impacting him? <clears throat> so, him or her. All right, we're taking a break at three o'clock. So we're gonna go for about 15 more minutes and then we'll take a break. On to B. All right, B1, define and provide examples of behavior, response, and response class. Behavior is defined as that portion of an organism's interaction with its environment that involves movement of some part of the organism, or behavior is the activity or movement of an organism. Behavior is anything that we do, including thoughts, feelings, all that. Example, typing on a keyboard, that's a behavior. I'm sure you can think of many other behavior examples. So think of one now and just have it in your head. All right, response. Actually, can someone give me a non-example of behavior? I'm curious. Happy? Happy? Thank you. Yeah. You yeah. Said you could give a, give a non-behavior? Yeah, you know what? Sometimes I get thrown off because we keep saying that like behaviors are thoughts and feelings too. What about sitting quietly? Sitting is not a behavior. Like sitting, sitting yeah, just sitting quietly is not a behavior. Exactly. No, they it's say but then behavior. if I then can I always go. You always got to think. It's something that you could see happen because. It's like acting out, basically. So it's if like you act it out, that's a behavior. That's what you have to look for. Yeah, it's the mm -hmm. movement. And mm -hmm. the dead man's yeah. test. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That's, that's, that's what I want to say. Dead man's man's test, but I wasn't yeah. sure if that was correct. Yeah, yeah. you're right. Yeah. 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 It's not a functional goal. So it's not functional at all. So you can't use that. Yeah. Um, yeah, when you think of behavior, I always think of what type of measurement I'm going to use to actually um, figure out this behavior. So am I going to use frequency? And if I can't do that, then I always think that it's not a behavior. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, is everyone able to take notes while I'm talking? I don't, I don't think I'm going too fast, but let me know if I need to slow down at all. I'm just trying to keep our, keep good time. You're good. Okay. I'm changing computers, so I'm going to pop off and pop back on again. I'm changing computers. Okay. I'm to my computer. Okay. All right. So we talked a little bit about behavior. Um, now we're going to go ahead and go to response. Response is a specific instance of behavior or an occurrence. Response is a specific instance of behavior or an occurrence. Okay. There is a technical definition. I did include it because you might as well know it, or at least see it once or twice. Um, the technical definition is an action of an organ organism's effector. An effector is an organ at the end of an efferent nerve fiber that is specialized for altering its environment mechanically, chemically, or in terms, oh my gosh, that's a typo, or in terms of another of other energy changes. So yeah, that definition sucks pretty bad, but it is the technical definition of response. Let me edit that real quick. There's no way I'd ever be able to memorize that in my entire life. <laughs> Not happening. Um, it's also a single, I think it's crucial that it's, you say single, right? Single instance of behavior. I can add that in, definitely. Yeah. It has to be sing like singular. Yeah. Is a singular. Because you're only responding to one action at a time or whatever the behavior is versus multiples, right? Right. It's a single instance mm -hmm. of behavior. Yeah. All right. Where was this at? Mm, I forgot where I was at. Oh, here it is. Um, example pressing a lever that's a response very simple example but hopefully 
that makes sense to y'all? <clears throat> now, response class. You know what? I'm going to scroll up. Does someone know what a response class is before I like talk about it? Wouldn't that be something that's in similar in form? Like it has to be corresponding to something that's happening already or not? I always get that mixed up with topography. Like, you know how you have the topography mm -hmm. of response class, so you, everything's similar and familiar or something like that? Uh -huh. they serve, it serves mm -hmm. the same function. The That's same function. Right? Like mm -hmm. so many serves. behaviors with the same function. Right. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else want to add anything? The topographies can be different as long as the response is the same. Which is topography of response class, right? Yeah, they can look, oh. but they have to serve the same function. Okay, yeah. got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, like pressing the lever, you can press the lever, I guess, if the lever is in the bedroom or the lever is green, you're still pressing it. I'm thinking mm -hmm. things are different, but you're still doing, you're still pressing the lever. Okay. Right. Nancy, I know you were going to say something, but you were cut off. What were you were going to explain? I was just going to say, like, the best one I think of for that is uh -huh. um, saying hi, hello. Like, there's so many. You can wave. You can say hi. Okay. You can Exactly. Do, that's yes. the way I think of it the best because there's yes. so many, so but many you're still ways. saying hi. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, one basically, a yeah. simple. It's a different way to have a greeting. A simple so action, basically. Hi. Yeah. Right. Okay. So okay. response class is a group of responses sharing the same function, function. Mm -hmm. but have different topography or aka yep. how it looks. Mm -hmm. How it looks. But the same function, which means okay. it generates the same consequence. So when I say a group of responses sharing the same function. They generate the same consequence, but they look different. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's the same action, but different, different. I, I guess a different way of seeing things, right? Like someone waves hi, different ways of doing hand things. up, but mm -hmm. someone way say hi just by nodding or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Different mm -hmm. ways of doing yeah. the same thing. Same thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's simplify it in your head like this. So I'm mm -hmm. doing a lot of different things, but I want to accomplish the same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I can fold the laundry different ways, but I'm still folding the laundry, right? Yeah. Okay. okay. That makes sense. All right. Thanks. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, example, tapping teacher's shoulder for attention, calling out her name, raising her hand so she'll walk over to you. They all look different, but I also just want her attention. I'm just doing it different ways. Okay. Okay. So that makes sense. B2. Does anyone still need help with response and response class before I move on to B2? Or if you're if you're taking notes, I can keep it up. I don't know who's doing what, but I can just I'm leave taking it up. notes. Okay, I'll leave it up while I read the next one. Wonderful. Thank you. Yep. All right, B2. Define and provide examples of stimulus and stimulus class. So we just did response and response class. Now we're doing stimulus and stimulus, stimulus, class. stimulus class. Okay, so take a pause for a second. Separate them. And think about what they mean before we go over it. So a stimulus is an energy change or either, either a change in the environment that affects an organism through its receptor cells. A stimulus is anything a person can experience through their senses, such as mm -hmm. being heard, smelled, seen, felt, tasted, etc. So a, a stimulus example, hearing a knock at the door. Mm -hmm. Smelling freshly cut grass. Mm -hmm. That's a stimulus. All right. So mm -hmm. is everyone good so far with that? 
Yep. What is the stimulus? Yep. Okay. Yes. Stimulus class is defined as a set or group of antecedent stimuli that have a common effect on operant class. Okay, so they have a common effect on how we receive them or what we do with it. So let's just let's just move into the the, the types of stimulus classes because I want I think this is going to be a little easier to understand. Uh, so there's three types of stimulus classes: formal, temporal, and functional. Formal temporal and functional ftf formal think about what formal means it's very similar to the word topography someone is trying to get in hold on violetta i don't even think that she signed up hello let's see oh my dog just barked <laughs> Um, no, let me see. Where was I at? She distracted me. Now I don't know where I was at. <laughs> oh, yeah, formal. <laughs> um, yeah, FTF. That's right. Thank you, Laura. Um, FTF, those are the three stimulus classes, right? What about formal? what about arbitrary? Yes, I'm going to get to it. Okay, I just I it. thought you were saying there was only three. Well, there's three right now that I want to focus on, but there's, there's, how can I say this? There's extension, there's like extensions of it. So arbitrary and, um, what's the other one? I forgot. Anyways, I'm going to get to those, but I wanted to start simple. <laughs> arbitrary and feature. That's right. All right. So formal, temporal, and functional. Let's just start right there. Cause that's that we, I just want to swallow this first. So formal means physical or typographically. No. God, I'm about to lose my mind in here. Go lay down. I keep losing my train of thought. Lose my dog. Stop. Formal means physically or typographically similar, such as color. Stop. Magnitude, shape, weight, etc. Different ways that it looks, different ways that it sounds. Okay. That's formal similarities. Temporal means time. Temporal time, temporal time. I am going to put you somewhere else if you do not be quiet, Missy. Temporal means time in relation to the behavior of interests. So we're going to look at a scatter plot. This might help us determine at certain times, when is this behavior likely to occur? I say, what does the behavior look like temporally right now? You might want to look at that chart and say, okay, it normally happens around 8 o'clock. Okay, that means temporal. Functional means similar effect on behavior, which is the same thing happening. So like, no matter if it's a bright light shining in my eyes, if it's grass from a mower, oh my God, hold on. Sorry guys, just one second. She's about to make me mad. All right, formal, no, not formal. Where was I at? Functional, yes. So, bright light going into your eyes. Yes, I'm all I'm all out of whack now because that dog. <laughs> um, <laughs> so no matter if it's a bright light shining in my eyes, if it's grass from a mower about to blow in my face, if it's strong wind, I'm still going to squint my eyes. So that's what I mean when I say functionally similar. The stimulus is functionally similar because I'm still squinting my eyes regardless, even though it's different ways that my eyes could be affected. 
All right, so another example of functional similarity, dancing to music, no matter what kind of music comes on. No matter if it's country music, is it hip hop, is it jazz, is it bossa nova, whatever it is, I'm gonna dance because it's music and I like music. Um, other ways to identify stimulus class, arbitrary and feature. So don't get too confused, but just try to stay with me here. I try to give plenty of examples because this is one of the harder things to sort of learn. Um, now my dog is asking to come back in here after she made me mad. Um, where was I at right here? Arbitrary, a group of stimuli that belong to the same category, but do not share common physical features. So example one, sources of protein. Chicken breast, chia seeds, eggs. I'm still getting protein, right? But I'm getting it in different ways. Oh, that's our break time. Why don't we pause right here and we'll come back in 10 minutes and we will finish up. Um, hopefully we'll finish up B in the next hour. Does that sound okay. good to everyone else? Yeah. Yes. In 10 minutes? 10 minutes. So it's like 310 or 311 ish. Come back and then okay. we'll resume. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Sounds good.
All right, we are back. Hopefully everyone got a chance to take a little break. Is my tab at all right? Is everyone ready? I'm pretty sure the answer is going to be yes to that. I'm going to go ahead and start. We left off at B2, uh, de define and provide examples of stimulus and stimulus class. We stopped at arbitrary stimulus class and feature stimulus class. So arbitrary, again, is a group of stimuli that belong to the same category, but do not share common physical features, AKA do not have the same topography, right? They don't have, they don't look the same. So with that in mind, the first example that I started to talk about was sources of protein. Chicken breast, chia seeds, eggs, all sources of protein that look differently. Types of vegetables, peas or corn. Things that reduce pain, ibuprofen, menthol rub, or heating pad. So these are all similar things. They have similar benefits, right? But they look differently. If something is in the same, if something is similarly in feature, it's a group of stimuli that belong to the same category and have similar physical features. So if you think about arbitrary, they're in the same category, but did not have physical features that were common. But when you look at the feature category, they have both the same type, same category, and they have the same physical, physical features. So example, things with tails cats, dogs, monkeys. They're all animals and they all have tails, right? Things with branches, hedges and trees. They both, they're both plants and they both have branches on them. Things that are the color green, kale, kiwi, and celery. They're all healthy food, but, and they're all green, right? Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. Okay. Hopefully those were okay yeah. examples. I tried to give yeah. like many because those are like more complicated. Um, so is everyone clear though, besides the arbitrary in, in the features? So Question. So okay. what is the one thing that you can differentiate features and arbitrary? Just that one thing that you can say, okay, this is feature, this is arbitrary. Well, feature, you're going to, it's going to be in the same category and like look similar. Look similar. Like, okay. So feature is like more than arbitrary. Arbitrary is like, it's in the same category, but they don't really look alike. Okay. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Arbitrary is like a lesser version of feature. Okay. So A comes before F. Okay. Like what? A, yeah. What is that? Oh, Go ahead. For formal. For formal? Yes, formal and feature. Sorry, I didn't hear your question. The difference between formal and feature. Formal and feature, well, formal is just pretty much how it looks or how, like, like is it, what color is it? Um, how loud was it? What shape is it? What weight is it? That's like, yeah, like, like the physical property. Size, yeah. The physical property. And feature is physical and functional? Feature is physical and in the same category, yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So maybe I should like, and I didn't really bold the terms because I was just, these are like how I type my notes out sometimes. Like I just type it all in one paragraph. 
Um, I didn't do this for all the ones because like the schedules of reinforcement, oh my God, I had to bold those terms because that was too much. But like for this, mainly remember FTF for the three types of stimulus classes. And then remember the other two types, like other sort of other variations of a stimulus class, which is like arbitrary and uh, feature. So if I say, if I say, okay, um, what are the feature similarities in doll and like in, in things with tails? You would say, all right, well, if I was looking for similar features, I would be looking for things that are very similar to each other, literally like an animal with a tail or an animal with ears or an animal with three eyes. I don't know. Like it's going to have the same, it's going to be very similar, but it's not going to, it's not going to look the exact same, but it's going to have similar things in common. How about like a tuxedo? Some tuxedos have tails. Some tuxedos have a short jacket. Right. Exactly. Because I think of formal and I think of tuxedo. So I connect the tuxedo to the different ways it can look. Mm -hmm. Right. And then with formal, you're going to just look at something that's topographically similar. Like, is it a similar color? Is it a similar magnitude? Like, nice. how loud? Like, is it similarly, like, you know, in volume? Like, they're, they're both loud. So they have formal, you know, formal similarities. Or... Uh, they're, they're functionally similar because I still squinted my eyes, even though it was a bright light. And then I squinted my eyes when I went outside because the mower was blowing grass near me. So that's a functionally similar stimulus that happened. But two different things happened to me. But I sat, but I had the same response to the, to that stimulus. Does that make sense? Yes. Or yes. if I hear music, the music is functionally similar because I dance no matter what. It doesn't matter what kind of music it was. It was still music. Mm -hmm. Right? So if I say, so someone can answer this. If I say, um, give me an example of a, of a stimulus class that has uh, formal similarity, what would you say? Would it, will we use bikes? You said what? Did what did you say? Bikes, like bicycle, wouldn't that be similar? Uh, uh, buying buying a bike, so you compare all the different bikes that you have. It looks the same, but you're all comparing the difference in function. One is faster, one is higher, or one is just for cruising, or whatever. Hmm. Let's see. What did you say? Formal or functional? Let's see. That would be out. I oh, was doing formal. Formal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the different types of bikes. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. whether it's a cruiser, whether it's a mountain bike, yeah. whether it's mm -hmm. a that's Some formal similarity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we say fruits that are round. What'd you say? Fruits that are round. Round that fruits. Have round, yes, round fruits, like oranges yeah. and um any any fruit that is that has a round circle. Right. So that's formal similarity. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. what uh, about what about? Say, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, what, what, what about would you say like a stop sign in the octagon? Would that be formal? Uh, compared to what? Compared to, as far as like the the, the shape. One of my clients is, I asked him the name a shape. And he'll say a stop sign. So it's like it's octagon. Yeah. So it's yeah. That, yeah. I used to give him that because it's it's octagon. Right. That's formal similarity because it yeah. looks similar at yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, is everyone good on stimulus and stimulus class? Let's go back and compare it to response and response class just really quickly. I know probably some people are like, please go back to that because now I need to compare the two. 
if I asked you one day, please tell me how can I differentiate response and response class to stimulus and stimulus class? Would you be able to tell the difference? Ah. Well, resp in response class, you're looking at more of the action and the behavior. So that's right. the way you will be able to distinguish the difference between the stimulus and the response class. Because exactly. you're looking at action versus what are you looking at an object to compare similarities between one and the other. Right. Right. So the response is like literally the response or the behavior. The behavior that you're doing mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. that are similar whereas if you have the stimulus class it's like what you're initially mm -hmm. experiencing and what mm -hmm. you're before you even re before you even react really how are these things similar how do these mm -hmm. things match up to what i what i'm used to seeing what mm -hmm. what am i smelling what am i feeling what am i tasting how is it similar to everything else? Before I even really respond, like a full like behavior that somebody can see, I'm in. I'm getting something. Like, I'm getting an idea. I'm thinking first. I'm comparing things. So it's really not like if you're trying to really like figure out a shortened way of of differentiating them. Just like think about how response is like. Response is after the stimulus. The stimulus mm -hmm. is first, and then it's the response. So, like the stimulus mm -hmm. is like you hear the you hear the music, and then you decide to dance. Yeah. Right, and then the the stimulus is gonna be like I'm trying to I'm, I don't want to over explain, but like, well, so isn't it like you, like you go to a party and you see your best friend walked through the door, how are you going to react? You're going to react like you're happy. So you're going to run up to her and give her a hug. So mm -hmm. wouldn't that be a simpler way to say it? Like you see someone you like and you like automatically you react to it. Hi, yeah. or you just wave, wave them down and say hi. That's a good example. Yeah, that is a good example. Sometimes that's I have really trouble like example. thinking about it in the moment, but like, yeah, so that that's good. I just don't want you to get on the test and like, accidentally confuse like stimulus no. class and response okay. class yeah absolutely i agree Can we look at the stimulus, like stimulus uh class as like an internal response almost like because it's happening before nobody sees it can yeah. can that be considered like internal well i mean we're thinking and how an we're gonna react well yeah i mean it, it's it's an experience okay so you experience it first before you even respond, really. Okay. I mean, it, the definition is a stimulus is anything a person can experience through their senses. So, so yeah. And so for me, I, I look at that as an internal response. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and then you respond, which is that which which is that specific instance, and then whatever you respond by doing mm -hmm. is you. It's you know your action, yeah. which you do. Yeah. yeah. And then based on what your action is, it yeah. can have similar outcomes, which is the response yeah. class. So but can we compare different. that to a private event? What do you I mean? Know. Like, you know how you, in a private event, only that certain individual would experience what's going on? Can we also compare that to a private event or no? Well, I mean, we can't really see an energy change. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can't really see that. Mm -hmm. So that's like me saying, yeah, I can tell they're, well, I mean, I, I don't know. Know. Individual I don't know. you could, you could, right? Yeah. Because it's an experience, right? Can we say, can, can we say that can happen individually? Like say you get up from bed and you didn't get a good night's sleep. It's going to actually affect the way you're going to react to others. Right. I think it could be, it could be unnoticeable or noticeable. I mean, it really depends on the, the magnitude uh -huh. or, you know, the, the obviousness of the stimulus, but Technically, the way the definition is worded, it's like an experience through your senses. So we can't always see that, mm -hmm. but sometimes it can be seen based on the, re well, can you see someone hearing? Not really. Not really, no. But you see, but you the, see the response reaction. hearing something. Yeah. yeah. 
and you see the response to them smelling something. Mm -hmm. Smelling something. You don't really see them smelling. You, like, you can't yeah. see that. But I don't want to get too caught up on that. But anyways, <laughs> are we are we good? Yeah, so far I'm fine. Yes. Okay. Um, B3, define and provide examples of respondent and operant conditioning. Woohoo, I love this one. Respondent conditioning, aka higher order conditioning, aka classical conditioning. I was confused about this on a mock one time, a little bit embarrassed, but that's okay. I got classical conditioning and respondent mixed up. I didn't think they were the same thing, but they are. So respondent conditioning is classical conditioning. It's also higher order conditioning. Those are three terms for the same thing. It's defined as a stimulus-stimulus pairing procedure in which a neutral stimulus is presented with an unconditioned stimulus until the neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus that elicits the condition response. Whew, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. But I put these in parentheses, like the process of respondent conditioning all the way until the condition response is developed. So when we're when we're implementing respondent conditioning, our ultimate goal is the condition response, right? So if you can see here, my mouse, I'm starting at the unconditioned stimulus mm -hmm. and i'm working my way all the way to the end result which is the condition response that's the goal with respondent conditioning we want a condition response to happen so we start with the unconditioned stimulus and we end with the conditional response okay i'm gonna i'm, I'm gonna go slow with this because it's hard so we're pairing stimulus together for this so the neutral stimulus is presented with an unconditioned stimulus okay the neutral stimulus then becomes a conditioned stimulus now let me stop right here this right here neutral stimulus where is it right here Neutral stimulus is presented with an unconditioned stimulus until the neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus. So you have an unconditioned stimulus, a stimulus that did not need training. You did not need training for this, this stimulus to be salient or, or have an effect on you. Okay. Would that count as like the reflex? Exactly. Yeah. So a reflex, something that just is automatically, right? We're gonna put a neutral stimulus with this reflex, okay? The neutral stimulus now is no longer neutral. It's conditioned. Are you with me on that so far? Yeah. Okay. So. Is it, can I ask a question? Is it conditioned because it's paired with the neutral stimulus? It's, hold on. The neutral stimulus is now conditioned because it was paired with the unconditioned stimulus. So the okay. unconditioned was already like we already were mm -hmm. trained on that. We were already doing mm -hmm. it. It was it mm -hmm. was automatic. We didn't mm -hmm. learn it. We mm -hmm. already had it, right? Mm -hmm. The neutral stimulus was paired with it. It's mm -hmm. now associated with the unconditioned stimulus. So now it's conditioned. Okay. We worked with the neutral stimulus to make it conditioned. Okay. Okay. So now that we have the first part down, now that we've taken the neutral stimulus and paired it with the unconditioned stimulus, now it's conditioned, mm -hmm. which results in a conditioned response. Okay? okay? Mm -hmm. That is the simplest way I know how to explain it. Okay. So let's go ahead and go to an example for this. Ivan Pavlov and his famous dog. Remember with the metronome and the, and the food and the salivation? He mm -hmm. conditioned 
these dogs to salivate at the sound of the metronome bell. The bell was a neutral stimulus before. You think the dogs heard a bell and said, oh, food, before he worked with them? No. He trained the dogs to salivate when they heard the bell because they thought they were going to get food. He paired the bell with the food, and then they said, okay, so food equals bell. So that means I'm going to salivate. That was the condition response. Mm -hmm. Do you all understand that? Yes. Okay. I hope I'm being clear because this isn't really easy. Um, so another example, little kids do not like getting an injection because it often results in pain, which is an unconditioned stimulus. Pain is unconditioned. We're going to feel it. We don't have to learn what pain is. We just know, right? We just, we just feel it and it hurts. That's all we know. It's a reflex. Let me start over. Little kids do not like getting an injection because it often results in pain, which is the unconditioned stimulus, which induces fear, unconditioned response. Therefore, hearing words like needle, vaccine, or injections, they're not conditioned stimulus, alone can induce fear in young children. Does that make sense? Yes. The yes. fact that they heard the words needle, vaccine, injection, that trained them to be scared because they know that that's associated with pain. That is an example of respondent conditioning. I have like a real life example. Like mm -hmm. um, I used to go to uh, Children's Hospital in Philly with my kids. As soon as we went to the one specific elevator, my son would start screaming because he knew we were going for blood work. Mm -hmm. So he became conditioned like, I'm going for blood work because we're going to this elevator, so I'm going to start screaming now. <laughs> right. Good example. Um, I don't mean to interrupt. I have a question. I'm getting confused right now, okay, mm -hmm. because this is the hardest for me too, like you said. Asia, it's very confusing. Mm -hmm. So unconditioned stimulus is what you already what you already have learned, right? What you already experienced. It's a reflex, right? yeah. Okay. The conditioned stimulus is what well, we're gonna start experiencing, like feeling scared and unhappy. Is that right? Or am I confusing myself more? Um conditioned stimulus is like am I learning that skill or am I not learning it? You've learned it from and conditioned. Okay. Yeah, you've it the conditioned is like learned. Conditioned means learned. Maybe I should so I already say. have the experience. Mm -hmm. Yes, you've learned based on these association that this is what this is a stimulus. This is kind of like a warning. Like before okay. it even happens, mm -hmm. you heard the word needle and now you're automatically scared. Okay. Mm -hmm. So That's where does response. okay? Unconditioned response. Or That's am a, I that is a conditioned response. When you've heard the word needle vaccine injection, and you know for a fact that anytime you hear that word, you've remembered pain, that mm -hmm. is a conditioned stimulus that is, now you have a conditioned response to that conditioned stimulus, which is- Oh my God, I'm getting confused. That's why I'm okay. getting confused. Asia, can I ask you a question? Yes. Why is the, uh, the, uh, the pain an unconditioned stimulus instead of unconditioned response? Because I thought that, the uh, the injection the injection is what caused the pain, so it should be a response to the injection that you 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 receive. Can I um? So it's really I just want to see right if there. I know it. Is that okay if I answer, Asia? Yeah, go ahead, please, Victoria. Please go ahead, please. Um, so for your question, Pamela. Yes. The reason that pain would not be conditioned is because um conditioned anything that's conditioned is learned. Uh -huh. So we didn't have to learn to uh -huh. feel pain. Okay, that, so why right? why is it pain not uh, why is it not an unconditional response? Because because it, because it protects us from, from dying. So that's a survival a survival instinct. Is whenever something pain is like it's like it's how we we've survived this long. So if we didn't uh -huh. learn about what hurts, we would uh -huh. just kill ourselves all the time, like without uh -huh. even really knowing like what could result in us being hurt. Okay. It's really for survival of species. Okay. So it's 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 unlearned. It's it's phi it's phylogeny. 
compared okay. to if you compare phylogeny and ontogeny. ontogeny. Phylogeny, we don't need to learn these things. We don't have time to learn all these things that we otherwise need to survive. We otherwise our human race would just die off so quick. Okay. So we're born knowing and we're born with instincts and all these behaviors that we don't need to learn or experience mm -hmm. to know that you know it's there. And pain is a part of the nine unconditional reinforcement. Am I saying it right? Unconditional yeah. reinforcement. Right? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. unconditional yes. reinforcements or okay. um, reflexes, they call it. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. Which okay. is like hunger, thirst, mm -hmm. sexual sensation, pain. Exactly. Um, yeah. So anything that it revolves around your senses and feeling is considered a sense as well. Oh, that 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 makes that makes sense now. Yeah. So yeah. if you can see it, feel it, touch it, taste it, smell it, um, mm -hmm. those are all your senses. So that's why those are considered unconditioned because it wasn't taught to mm -hmm. us. Right. Okay. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thanks for jumping in there too. Everyone else, I don't, I can't see names, but. Thank you, Wh whoever was talking. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh yeah, it was everyone, but I just oh, yeah. learned that from like, just from learning with my own son, like just different things that you know that are not taught that they automatically know, like so pain is something. But as far as like learning where pain comes from is taught. So like if you touch a hot stove, that is now taught to you not to touch it again. Right. Yeah. So um, that's the condition but, then. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but the initial pain itself is wasn't taught to him. It's just where it came from. So the stove was hot. So now he's not going to touch it again because that delivers that pain that he knows about already. That he knows is bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's okay. So that example that you provided. So that's conditioned stimulus or response. He's a stimulus, right? So it would be a, the action of touching the stove would be yeah. um, the response. The response, okay. The response, and then pulling it back. Yeah, pulling the hand back is a condition response. response. Okay, but okay. yeah. <clears throat> so he's learned. Okay, I think I'm getting it. Okay. So anything condition like stimulus or response is always you're learning right because you don't have those skills yeah. yet okay condition means learn to learn okay unconditioned is unlearned or unconditioned is like reflex or automatic okay got it okay. all right okay just like blinking your eyes on condition when someone's about to spray you know water so chemicals in your eyes are you going to learn that that's bad or you just want to squint you're just going to squint because that's automatically like what you're going to do because you okay. don't want anything in your eyes. Uh, okay. I think they also said the same thing for like sneezing. It's like mm -hmm. a, a reflex as well. Like it's not something that's taught. It's just, you just do it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um. So we're going to go ahead and keep going. Um, where was I at? There are four words like hearing needle, vaccine, our conditional response, condition stimulus, and can induce fear, condition response. All right, operant conditioning. Operant conditioning is the process and selective effects of consequences on behavior. Operant behavior is any behavior whose future frequency is determined by its history of consequences or reinforcement or punishment or automacy of reinforcement. Anything basically based on the past that's happened to you that's operant learning. You're going to choose based on what's happened in the past to, to do it or not to do it again. Um, example, I push my chair in when I get up in class and my teacher smiles at me. I continue to push my chair in because the teacher's smile is reinforcing to me. I chose to push my chair in after she smiled at me because I like when she does it, so I'm going to do it again. Uh, there's four types of stimulus changes in operant conditioning. There's a positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, and negative punishment. Behavior can also be put on extinction. Extinction is the absence of reinforcement for a given behavior. So you just no longer see responses to what you're doing. Your behavior is being put on extinction because you're no longer 
accessing reinforcement for that. All right. And so you would uh, like, so if you, I don't think it says it right. Yeah, no, this is about respondent and operant conditioning. But if I said operant extinction or respondent extinction, that's when I say like you're unpairing whatever the response was that you were used to before to nothing. So like you're expecting to get a smile from your teacher and you didn't. And eventually you might stop pushing it in your chair, depending on the individual. But some people might be like, you know, I'm not going to push my chair in if she's not going to smile or say thank you or whatever. So that's operant extinction. That's just a little example about extinction for those who still are not very clear on it. But it's pretty simple. It's just no reinforcement is being delivered. So therefore, you're unpairing it and you're basically unconditioning um, the two the two occurrences of the two, um, the behavior and the response. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have a question. Yes. I always get positive and negative punishment mixed up. What is the easiest way to remember the difference between one and the other? Well, reinforcement is just going to always be increasing the likelihood of the behavior happening again, right? Mm -hmm. So it, the, when I say reinforce, if you, if you think about how a bridge is built, they're going to put a lot of reinforcement on that bridge because they don't want the bridge to break when cars are driving over it, right? They're going to mm -hmm. reinforce the bridge so that it stays strong, right? Mm -hmm. They want that bridge to stay standing, okay? When I say reinforce, always think about the likelihood is increased that they're that they will do it again. The likelihood is just higher. Okay. Mm -hmm. When I say punishment, the likelihood is lower. Mm -hmm. One is encouraged, one is discouraged. Okay. Reinforcement is encouraged, punishment is discouraged. We don't want to see them do it again if we want if we implement a punishment procedure. So if okay, so let me give you an example and let me see if I understand it right. Mm -hmm. So my my client is tantrum every time he sees his mom come up, right? Come up while we're doing session. So what mom is reinforcing. So mom is a positive reinforcement, right? Uh, depends. Okay. Depends on if they. I mean, if so, if something is happening repeatedly as a result of someone's behavior, then yes, mm -hmm. they're being reinforced. Okay. Is that your question? Because the kid keeps doing the same thing and, and you're saying that the mom is, is, is acting as the positive reinforcer. Yeah, so that's what I'm thinking about. continuing to do the same thing. Yeah. Is that right? Yes, because it's happening more. Yes. It's happening at a constant rate. It's, it keeps happening. That's a reinforcement example. Okay. So yes. if I tell mom not to come down while I'm doing session, will that be a negative punishment or a positive punishment or is it not a punishment mm, it did, i mean if, if you I tell her not, not to come not down to, yeah not to come not up to come down, down how is the kids how is the kids behavior affected by that yeah um, that's more like an intervention right if you told the parent not to come like well, all, it all depends on what the, the does the occurrence of the of whatever the kid is doing does the occurrence go up or down that will be the, the difference between reinforcing and punishment. And I think you can even say the example, if you tell mom not to come down, uh -huh. that you telling her that, did it reinforce her behavior or did it punish her behavior? Because the parent can still come down, then that okay. was, if the parent stays up, mm -hmm. right? We have to. If the parent continues to come after you said it, you reinforce the parent. <laughs> right? so if she doesn't come, that was punishment. Then you punish the behavior. <laughs> then right. you punish the behavior. Okay. It all has to do with did it keep happening or not? That's no. what you want to know. Okay. So who so this is you see, I'm trying to figure out when is it punishment, when is a positive punishment, and when is a negative punishment. So I'm still trying to distinguish between both of them. Like who am I I'm am I say. punishing the child for the behavior or am I punishing a behavior? A behavior not reinforcing the behavior is that punishment that's what i'm getting to i don't i don't get it so for punishment it, if it's positive it means you're adding something to decrease that behavior okay. so are you at so what you're technically doing would be negative punishment because okay. you're taking away the presence of the mom to uh -huh. decrease the child's behavior tantruming or whatever 
and so the child behavior was when mom is around. Okay. So that's how you know the difference between positive and negative punishment. But mm -hmm. as far as the difference between reinforcement and punishment mm -hmm. will determine what the behavior like happens after you did it. So when you took something away, like mom's attention, mm -hmm. did it increase his behavior? Did he continue doing it? It increases if, the behavior when they took right. mom away. Yes. Okay. So it was technically negative reinforcement. That okay. was the So it's not punishing the behavior because the behavior kept going. But okay. even though you took mom away, now it's considered negative reinforcement. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. You got, got it, Joe? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> you think? Okay. Yeah. I'll, Thank I'll, you. I'll give you another example just really quickly. If okay. I'm reinforced, I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. Did, was I reinforced in the situation or was I punished? You were punished. Well, I'm, I'm going to give you an example. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I held the door for my friend and she said, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I kept holding the door for her for the next years. Okay. I kept doing it. Was I reinforced by her saying thank you and smiling at me or was I punished? You were reinforced by her saying thank you. Right. So I kept doing it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was reinforced. Yes. All right. Was I punished or reinforced when my mom slapped me <laughs> uh, after I took cookies out of the cookie jar and I did not take any cookies anymore? Was I punished or reinforced? You were punished. Right? Exactly. Because yeah. I stopped doing it. Yeah. Okay. 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 That, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Now, positively or negatively punished? Ready? Okay. Was I positively punished? When my mom said I could not go to my friend's house because I skipped class, was I positively or negatively punished? You were, oh my God. Okay. You said you I were, couldn't go. Couldn't go. So you, you were, were positively punished. punished. Negatively punished, punished, negatively punished, punished, punished because you weren't allowed to go. So it's a negative, right? Because you weren't allowed away. to go. Something is taken away. Yeah. Okay. Like a negative number, It's I took away too much. Okay. Okay. So you were taking okay yeah it's like me away. taking my son's video games away because he didn't pass his he didn't do good on his report card so that's a negative punishment right exactly yes okay right. now i get it okay. now you got it and now we got it would that okay. last example make more sense okay okay so i will good. give him a five dollars if he washed the dishes for me so that's a positive because he's getting something in return right positive or reinforcement yeah enforcement so if what he is does it again <laughs> <laughs> if he does it again mm -hmm. yeah i think it's i think you have to remember that it's only yes, positive it again if in the it increases the behavior if you just give them the if you just give them uh -huh. money for if good grades or for if you took something away because he got a bad report card that's yeah. not either it has to be that he increased or decreased his behavior exactly in the future Okay, Correct. so uh -huh. so for the next report card, he got all A's, right? So yeah, he really increased. Correct. He increased. So that's a positive punishment. No, no, no. That's a oh, good thing that he got the grades. You wanted him to get the grades. Okay. So okay, I think I'm getting it. Okay, so he got the grades. So I did a positive reinforcement by giving him back his video games, right? Am I thinking that right? Yeah, here, let me, okay. you, yeah, I'll, I'll, message, I'll message you some more examples. Okay, you do that. I don't yeah, want to hold anybody else. Because I don't want to yeah. get too far behind, exactly. but I love all the questions and all the <laughs> yeah. conversations. Okay, yeah. sounds good. All right. Um, I forgot why I was that. Oh, yeah, so it was, let's see. Oh, yeah, I think I was on B4. Yes. All right, yeah, B4. B4. Mm -hmm. Define and provide examples of positive and negative reinforcement contingencies. All right. So, positive reinforcement, we just talked about this actually, mm -hmm. um, is the addition of a stimulus to increase the probability or likelihood of the behavior happening in the future. Negative reinforcement is the removal of a stimulus to increase the likelihood that a behavior will occur in the future. Okay? So, both 
positive and negative reinforcement, we want to increase the likelihood of them that person doing that thing again, right? But the difference is the stimulus removal or addition. Okay, so who's trying to get in? Oh, that was a um, chat. So those are the two um, positive and negative reinforcement definitions. Example for positive reinforcement, I smiled at Billy for using manners at the ice cream shop and now he does it whenever we go back. My smile was the positive addition, the, 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 the stimulus addition, and now he does it all the time. He, he uses manners and he's really sweet at the counter when he goes with me. Negative reinforcement, I told Veronica she did not have to take out the trash if she finished her homework before five o'clock. Now, when it's close to five, she makes sure her home she makes sure her homework is done to avoid having to do the trash. So, I took away in this situation because I said she didn't have to do the trash. So that's the stimulus that I took away. I said no trash if you finish your homework, and now she does her homework more. She does it before five o'clock to avoid taking the trash out. All right, B5. Hopefully we can get through this before our next break because this is a long one. Um, whew. Define and provide examples of schedules of reinforcement. I might want to drink some water for this because it's a lot. Fixed ratio. Each occurrence, okay? Fixed ratio is each time, each occurrence, each time that I open my drawer, each time that I open the fridge. That's fixed ratio. Fixed interval. Interval means time. Does everyone know that? Because for a while I did not put two and two together. I mean, I, I've known it for a long time, but at like the first two months of my program, I was like, interval, interval, what in the world? So interval means time. Like you're working out, right? And you have the intervals, like like, like if you're doing um, like a workout video and it's like, all right, we're going to do a couple intervals, like one's going to be fast, one's going to be slow, like we're going to do all these different types of intervals. Time. Like, what do they call it? Hit? Yeah, hit. That have certain intervals of like types of exercises. Hold on. Come on in. All right. Variable ratio after an approximate number of occurrences. So not every three occurrences, but every, you know, sometimes it's after three, sometimes it's after four, sometimes it's after five, but the average is four, right? So a rough number. Uh, variable interval approximate number of minutes or uh, approximate amount of time however long it is not necessarily minutes but hours whatever it is we don't want to do an hourly schedule of reinforcement for a client obviously because that's a little bit tough typically you're, it's going to be lower so let's just say amount of time um approximately so maybe the client receives reinforcement after five minutes and then they receive reinforcement after 10 minutes and then it's 20 minutes but then they receive reinforcement at eight minutes. And then we say, okay, the average is like 10 that they're receiving the reinforcement. Okay, get ready for the compound schedules. You might wanna take notes for this because it's not easy. Um, it's seven of them, seven compound schedules. First one is a multiple schedule. A multiple schedule is two or more schedules for one behavior that are each presented with different SDs, different discriminative stimuluses, okay? Dis <laughs> discriminative stimuli, I'll say that, that's the proper English. But SD is the abbreviation for discriminative stimulus. For those that do not know, that's what it stands for. Example of multiple schedule. Jake was required 
when working with his math teacher to get 12 out of 20 questions right to receive reinforcement. But with his math tutor, he had to he had to get 17 out of 20 to receive reinforcement. Okay? So again, Two or more schedules for one behavior. The behavior in this scenario was him scoring a certain score on the math test, right? The two SDs was the math tutor and then his regular uh, math teacher. So those were the two SDs. And the one behavior was him getting a certain score. He received reinforcement differently because he, like I said, he needed 12 out of 20 for the first teacher, but he needed 17 out of 20 for the math tutor. Does that make sense? Explain that again, please. Yes. You said explain it again? Yes. All right. Two schedules. The two schedules was the 12 out of 20 and the 17 out of 20. Okay. Those were the. Those were the two requirements, the, the two score requirements, right? Those are the two schedules for one behavior. Behavior was getting the certain certain score. So his his behavior was, I have to get this score, and then I have to get this score with her with her. One behavior, two SDs. The SD was the math teacher. In the math tutor. Those were two different SDs. Two different people, two SDs. Okay? So in order for him to have received reinforcement, he needed to get different scores for different people. But the behavior was the same. So, I don't think I have a simpler way of that, like, than that, honestly, if someone else, I mean, we're going to run out of time because our break is in two minutes, but if someone else would like to explain that for the next minute or so, or just add something, they can. I think um, what I'm getting at, and, I, and I, I got it, multiple schedules, you have, you have two schedules. Two or more. Two or more schedules. But each each re reinforcement schedule is different. Exactly. One one schedule you have to have you got to get twelve out of twenty to get the reinforcement, and the other one you have to have seventeen out of twenty to get the reinforcements. It's just like saying, um, like when you go when you go to Walmart. And they have, like, you go to Walmart and you get 10% off XYZ, but you can go to Target and get a better discount off the same item. That makes sense? And the <laughs> yeah, no, you're I'm good. Trying to put, yeah, I'm trying to put it in real life terms. I mean, a, yeah. A I really mean, good way to think of it is divorce. <laughs> Two homes. Um. I want to hear this one. <laughs> Two schedules reinforce. You're aware of the contingencies, but it's just different. Um, how do I describe? Yeah, it's it, it's like two home, two homes at Dad's house. You can have ice cream for dinner. At there you Mom's go. House, you can have you have to have broccoli for dinner. There you so go. So it's it's di the both the behavior is dinner, but the reinforcement only comes when you finish when you get the broccoli on ice cream something like that <laughs> yeah if multiple, that's the way i'll I find am. another one i'll find another example <laughs> when we get back from our break but if you're still here i did copy and paste the links to contribute if you'd like to do that uh for your attendance today um otherwise we're going to take a break for 10 minutes and i'll see y'all back at 4 10. bye all right
Hello, fellow studying people. <laughs> We're back and ready to roll. I'll allow another 30 seconds or so for those to get back on and situated. Um, hello, Jennifer. Welcome. I don't think we've met before. Have you filled out um, the Google form? Because I'm trying to get everyone to fill that out first um, so that you'll just get the invites when I send them out weekly. So if you're here and you have not filled out the Google Forms, please do that. Otherwise, sometimes you may not be able to come to study sessions. <clears throat> Thank you in advance. I'm going to look at participants because I'm curious. Uh, Cherry, have you filled out the form before? I think I've filled up some form, but I'm not sure if it's the same one. Okay. It's the, the only form you should have filled out was the um, Google form for the sign up for those sessions. The only other form is the removal off the list form. Okay. Let me fill it up now. Okay. You don't have to do it now if it's bad for you, but just in the future, if you do want to be invited back, it's easier if you just fill it out so I can copy and paste your email. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and Victoria, have you filled it out? Or Violetta? Uh, no, it's my first time participating. Oh, okay. Well, welcome. Um, just go to the featured section on top. Um, it's really close to the top of the group homepage. And you'll see um, in the featured section, and you'll just see the, the form there at the top. If you want to come back, I don't know if you do, but if you do want to come back, please fill it out. Because I do sessions once or twice a week. I don't see it. Um... Okay. Um, Okay. I'll tag you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe I'm not making it apparent enough. Um, what I so see, um, um, because I'm using my phone. Um, oh, okay. I don't see all, all the other features. You see um, on the top of the page where like there's a uh, discussion guides featured reels members media files and all that like at the very top where you like almost post that there's a featured section okay 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 and the featured section shows the pinned posts so one of them says hello and welcome that's the one that i'm talking about and it has the form linked on there okay do you see that Yes. Okay, perfect. So if anyone else needs to do that, please do that uh, before I send out the next round of invites, which is probably going to be tomorrow or the next day. So right. you, t you testing on Wednesday, Riley? I test Wednesday at 1 o'clock. So that means you're going to do, when you pass, when you pass, are you still going to do study groups? Yes, so I will be doing a study group once I pass at least once a week. That's my goal. Um, just because I really like doing these, I, I do it out of enjoyment, not because I want to make money. Um, if I wanted to make money, I would charge, and that's why I don't charge. So I go based on donations, which I actually don't get that many, surprisingly. So I kind of wonder, is it because I don't do a good job or because people just don't really think it's you know something they can afford i don't know but some people have donated like ten dollars twenty dollars like that's fine and everything that's kind of what i was hoping for but yeah i'll continue to do it once a week um even after i pass and then maybe twice a week if i have time but mostly once so um that's that but I, I really do enjoy, like, I, I actually feel like it gives me something to do in terms of, like, just brushing up on, you know, 
concepts and talking to people and getting to know them. I, I enjoy that part of it. So definitely going to keep going. Yeah, and that's, and that's what we need. Somebody, mm -hmm. that's what we need. Group, even when we pass, we still need to be in groups and 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 doing um, study groups and everything because it helps a lot. Yeah, um, thank you. I appreciate that. And I, I have donated I was, too. <laughs> huh? I say I did donate. I have donated too. So. <laughs> oh, okay. I don't, I don't think I've seen it. I don't think I've seen it honestly because I think. I've only gotten two donations since I started. Yeah, you sent um, me a thumbs up on um, Cash App. I did, did Cash App. Oh, yeah. you know what? Yes, that was you. Thank you. I forgot about that. Um, I think I actually made a mistake too with my study guide link because someone just chatted that they needed that they wanted to buy it, and I realized that the link is messed up. So I'm going to repaste that. Um, that was kind of a dumb mistake. But, yeah, that's what I did. I purchased the, uh, I thought it was something, I, I purchased it and I thought it was something else. And it's just the um, Excel sheet. And I was thinking it was this, what we're doing now. Oh. Yeah. Well, it was, okay. So yeah. it is this though. It's, it's just not, so this is a, an additional sheet that I put together. I, I mean, you know what? I'm going to be nice. I'm willing to share this. <laughs> if you want it. Yeah, I will... yeah, I do. But I said, I said, well, it'd be a donation. It'd be a do it, was, it wasn't what I thought it was, but I said, I could, I'd donate to it anyway. So I'm well, nervous. here, let me show, <laughs> let me show everyone else because maybe you also, you're not the only one that thought that. So let me just, so this is what I designed. Um, I made a spreadsheet and it's going to be quick because we're going to waste time. But this is what I made to study. So I put together a couple of spreadsheets that had everything in one, right? So I put all the Cooper chapters together and I listed, oops, I listed all the terms in each chapter in a row or in a column. In a column. I, get, I bought it. Yeah. It's, a good, it's a good thing to have. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so I can go and check, okay, do I know this? Do I know that? Do I know yeah. this? Yeah. And this is what I'm doing like um, tomorrow. I'm going to go through and check whatever I don't know. I'm going to go back to that chapter and memorize it and get to know it. Mm -hmm. So this is all chapter two. Yeah. And then I go back up and I can mark mastered or mm -hmm. still needs review. And I'm going to work my way across all the way to the end. And I'm going to go down and check each term. Do I know what a setting compound is? Do I know what a subject compound mm -hmm. is? Yes or no. If I need to put notes, then that's what I'll put notes right there. Okay. So this is what I made just to get organized with what I know and don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go on the exam. That is really good. You did good on that one. That's a good guy. That is really good. Because I've been studying, so I went back and I put what I think I knew and I kind of did and what I didn't I just put a, a like a red mark on there so I know mm -hmm. I have to go back to it but it's nicely set up it's thank you it. yeah wow. mm -hmm. yeah and it's really cheap like when you get all the Cooper terms yeah. listed for you mm -hmm. and even like if you listen to the Pearson audiobook you can type notes as you're listening yeah to mm -hmm. the Pearson audiobook so I could literally be typing absence of reinforcement yes Mm -hmm. And while I'm listening to it, and then just go mm -hmm. down as it's talking yeah. and just put the terms in there. So I formatted it so you could just go across and then mm -hmm. mark. And then for the next sheet, it's literally almost the same, but it's just by taskless item. Mm -hmm. And it's chapter one has like all the A, chapter two has some A and B. Mm -hmm. And pretty much you can just go and check like each item. And then you can mark, did I review this at least two times, one time? Like, did I do it three times? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. wow. So that's, that's, really that's how I designed it. Yeah. Thank you. And then this is the best part. And I think you can actually mark your schedule each week, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, whatever you want to mm -hmm. do. You mm -hmm. can put in what you want to do. You can even put times if you want, instead of the days, you could put times of the day. Like mm -hmm. if I wanted to do Monday and just like do five o'clock or whatever, instead of like the days of the week you could do whatever you want it it's just fully customizable and then you could change the percentage of completion all the way up here so 
however you want to use it you can customize it do whatever yeah um so yeah that's what i made this was a bonus sheet i'm willing if you buy the study guide like if you want it i will insert this sheet for you if you want it i'll get mine tonight just insert that for me please. <laughs> yeah i'll send I'll i'll literally put it in for you Okay. It's good. Anyone. It's good to have. Yeah. The spreadsheet is very well set yeah. up. I can tell you that much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. but if you share it, share your spreadsheet with me, and I will insert this sheet in your spreadsheet. If you oh, want. for real? <laughs> okay. Yeah. If you just share it with me, I'll I'm willing to do that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, someone just asked, how can you donate? Um, which link would you like to click? Because I can repaste it. No. Not the, the PayPal one. Oh, the PayPal. Yes. Um, yeah, this is just the one-time link. Mm -hmm. Let me test it myself because sometimes it doesn't work. PayPal went a little weird for me. I had to like get a code and go back in to send some money, but it, it did work. I just had to go in and out. Okay, I'm sorry about that. I I think Venmo is much better for this. Hey, I don't like think this. it was even your fault. I think it was PayPal. Okay, Venmo is easier to donate if you go through Venmo. Okay, well, mm -hmm. I um just repasted the PayPal link if you need it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, anyways, cool. Whoever um purchase whoever purchases the study guide, it's in the link above. Um, and you want me to put our notes from this uh, today's meeting in it, I will insert this sheet in yours, but you have to share it with me or else I really have no way of do doing that. How do you share it through the Google, through the spreadsheet app? So right? you would go to the you would go to your Google Sheets, let me okay. see. Mm -hmm. And you would just hold on wait. So do you see where it says share right here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you would share, press share, and then you mm -hmm. just type my email. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you type uh, my a carry dot ABA mm -hmm. and then I'll just, I'll, I can go in and whatever you need customized to, I can customize it for you. All like right. if something isn't working, I can just mm -hmm. easily customize it or whatever color change you want. Mm -hmm. I can okay. do that. Too. All right. Thank you. I love computers. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I have a question for you. How long yeah. will you keep it up to purchase just because I just can't do it right now at this moment to buy it, but I was just wondering. <laughs> So I'm going to keep it up for a long time. And then any updates um, I'll send out, I can just update it for you. Like if, if I want to add something in, I'll just say like, if you want me to add something in, like, let me know. And then I'll just go in and fix each person's sheet. But um, I'll have it up for a long time. Okay, thank you. That would be helpful. I just can't get it today. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, no, don't apologize. I've even given one away. Like sometimes I'll do like scholarship. Like if I notice someone's really struggling, I'll just give it to them. Um, so occasionally I'll just like randomly just decide to give someone in the group is like one of my spreadsheets. But probably like once a month I'll do that. Not all the time. So yeah. Oh, thank you, Pamela. I saw your donation. Uh, Crystal, it says won't allow me to purchase. Um, well, I don't really know how else to share the link. I will message you, Crystal, if I have to, because I don't want to waste too much time on them. Does, has anyone else been able to click the link to the study guide and actually be able to like get to it? What do you mean? Like to purchase or to download? To purchase it. Cause I, I went through the one that you, when you first started at the beginning, the first post you did, you just had to click on the link and it opened up with no problem. Okay. When you, when you did it for the first, first time. The okay. Link, I'm going to reshare the link yeah. um, in mm -hmm. the chat just so in case someone can't, see it maybe i need yeah. to just it and again. it directly it takes you directly to where to where the purchase is and everything mm -hmm. okay cool thank yeah. you so much all no right problem. let me put this link in the chat and then we'll keep going um okay it might be because you're on your phone tiffany thomas 
Um, you could just go to the good leopard dot cell. Let's see. Is it dot sellfi dot store? I forgot what it's called. Yeah, the good leopard dot sellfi dot store. That's like the shortened version. I'm gonna put that in the chat too. Dot sellfi dot store is the shortened link. If you just copy and paste that into your URL or like put the www in front of it, actually, duh. www dot All right, let me know if anyone else has trouble and then I'll just individually message you the link um, after this. All right, so back to schedules of reinforcement. Um, where was I at? And if I forget to um, add in your sheet, just email me and I'll do it like that same day that you email me. Where was I at? I need to go over tutorials too because it's a little bit confusing sometimes. Where was it? All right. Collapse it up there. And then 125. All right. Cool. So mixed schedule. Two or more schedules for one behavior, each presented without any SD. Reinforcement is delivered in random order. The client doesn't know when they will be reinforced. Example, Julio would, excuse me, Julio would sometimes receive reinforcement for eating vegetables. He ate three spoons full of peas and received reinforcement. And sometimes he ate five spoonfuls, spoonfuls of peas and received reinforcement. Julio continued at high rates eating his veggies as he did not know when he would be reinforced. So a mixed schedule like this is really good if you want a behavior to continue to occur at high rates. The person does not know when they will receive the reinforcement because sometimes they receive it for this, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they receive it for doing more, sometimes they don't. It's like kind of like a variable, right? It depends. It's it's really not a, a clear there's no clear warning there's no clear sd to tell to tell the person when they will receive reinforcement for doing such behaviors okay so there's two or more schedules for one behavior the one behavior in this scenario is him eating the vegetables one time he eats three spoons full one another time he eats five he doesn't know when he's going to receive reinforcement but he just keeps going does that make sense yes Okay, we're going to keep going. Chain schedule. Think about it for a second. When you hear chained, what comes to mind? Connection. Yep. Connection. It's connected. It's in order. So it, with the chain schedule, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just thinking like a sequence or an order. A sequence. A sequence. Yeah, an order. Exactly. So that's actually one of the key ways that someone will be able to tell a chain schedule compared to a tandem. We're going to get to tandem in a minute, but tandem is when it's the order does not matter. The chain is when the order does matter. So let's continue with chain. A, com a compound schedule that has two or more basic requirements. Okay. Hold on. Who's raising their hand? Donna? Yes? I apologize if I raised my hand by mistake. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so a compound schedule that has two or more basic requirements that occur one after the other, also called successive. Whenever you hear the word successive, that means one after the other. Whenever you hear simultaneous, that means at the same time. Okay, so don't confuse successive and simultaneous. Successive is one after the other. In this case, 
the basic requirements in a chain schedule occur one after the other, and they have a SD for each schedule. So like we said, there's always a specific order. The first behavior serves as an SD for the next and so on. Example, following a recipe card my mother gave me to make spaghetti. I put one ingredient in at a time according to the directions. I have an order, right? I'm putting one in at a time. I finished the spaghetti in 25 minutes and it tastes good. Okay. So one of the keys to a chain schedule is that the person must work through a sequence of simple schedules in order to obtain the sought after reinforcer. So they want they want the end result a certain way, right? We want this food to taste good. That's our that's our goal at the end of, of a meal is we we want we cooked and we want it to taste good. Okay. So that's going to be the sought after reinforcer here. We're working to get to that end. And there is a specific order in which to get there. So chained one after the other. I'm following one step. I'm putting in the, I'm boiling the water. Okay. Now I know since the water is boiling, I need to go ahead and get the pasta, put in the pasta. That's my SD. The water was boiling and now that's telling me, okay, now I need to go ahead and get the pasta in. Okay, now I need to add the salt. That each part, each time that I do the, the first the step, the next step is going to be my move. But the but the step before that was my SD because I knew once I finished this step, I need to go to the next step. That's the SD each time mm -hmm. that you finish your step. Okay. You're working through a sequence. And at the end, you get what you want. Now, let's think about tandem. Don't confuse tandem with chain. Tandem has no SDs, okay? There's no order at all. So I'm going to give an example of tandem. My mother forgot to give me the recipe card for her spaghetti, and now I'm freaking out. I don't have the recipe card, so guess what I have to do? I have to figure it out. I still need the food on time, finish for my family. So I'm just gonna start throwing in all the ingredients out of order. I don't need, I don't remember what to do exactly, but I know I need to finish this food. So I'm gonna put in all the ingredients out of order in a rush, and I'm just gonna go off my memory, right? So I, I still want to finish. I still want to get to the end, but I don't know when I'm going to receive the reinforcement. I just know that I have to finish this food. I still finish in 25 minutes and the food tastes good. So the difference between chained and tandem is there's no SD in tandem, but there is SDs for chained. Does that make sense to everyone? <clears throat> Yeah, yes. that makes sense. I tried to give simple examples. I don't know if it really like fully covers like everything that you're trying to sort of understand about it, but that's a very basic example of a chain versus a tandem. That's a really good example. Okay. Thank you. The Can same I give you an example? With, with brushing your teeth. Go ahead. Yes, please. No, no, I was gonna um like a chain schedule. It's like when I dress my my grandkids is t-shirt, underwear, socks, shirt, pants, shoes. But then when they dress themselves, it's like tandem, like they put the pants on, then the socks on. Sometimes they try to put the shoes on before they put the socks on. So is that like a um example? Um yeah, that would be and a good uh, example. Yeah, that would. Because I guess I was trying to like make sure that like even though the the, the clothes are put on out of order, like it, it's I mean it's still fine. Like yeah. at the at the end of the day, like they're still gonna be dressed. So yeah, I think that would yeah. be a good example. Yeah, but at the end of the day, they're still dressed you just with my OCD. It's just like <laughs> I have like a chain schedule and they have like a tandem schedule. Yeah. I like that. That works. Because really, really what you need to remember is that with tandem, there is no order, right? Yeah. That's the key is remembering that there is no order and there's no SD.
the chain, each step is my is my indicator that the next step is coming. Perfect. Okay. So concurrent. Maybe I should zoom this in more. Is this zoomed in enough for y'all or should I make it more big? I can zoom mine in on my make it, side. Make it more big. Okay, I can try that. Let me see if I can do 150%. Okay, that's probably better. Yeah. By the way, those who get the spreadsheet, it, whenever you want to zoom in something, like, yeah, it's like right here, right up top. And then you can collapse the bar um, of all the file edit view insert by pressing this little arrow right here, and it collapses it, and it makes it more... Um, more of the actual content versus like the functions up there. So, sorry, was someone gonna say something? <clears throat> All right, so, let me see. Where was I at? Oh, so we got um, all the basic schedules done, we got, uh, multiple schedule, mixed schedule, chain, tandem. And now we're on concurrent. So concurrent means it's a, it's a compound schedule with two or more schedules. Each have an SD, but they operate, they operate independently and simultaneously <laughs> for two or more behaviors. So stay with me. Two or more schedules. They each have an SD. They operate independently and simultaneously. Simultaneously means at the same time, but independently for two or more behaviors. It is a combo of two or more of the basic schedules. Okay, so think of these as like the sisters, and they're it, it's it's a combo of the sisters for the concurrent. So fi, fr, vi, and vr, some sort of combo of of the basic of the of the sister schedules. All right, now here's where this gets sort of more tricky, but it's going to help you remember it in a way because it's very special from the other schedules. It's different. Um, this schedule is governed by matching law. Now, this schedule is going to give the learner more of a choice. Okay. Whenever I say concurrent schedule, you're going to think of the learner having more of a choice and the learner doing what they think is going to be more reinforcing to them, aka matching law. Behavior goes where reinforcement flows. That is matching law. Okay. So when I say matching law, that means that the person is going to do what they find more reinforcing, whichever schedule. Here's an example of that. You establish an FR20 or fixed ratio 20, 20 occurrences, plus an FI 30 or fixed interval 30, fixed interval time 30 minutes. So FR 20 and FI 30. You establish these two schedules where the client can either choose to do 20 math problems, which is the FR 20, or read for 30 minutes, which is the FI 30. The client has a choice between the two behaviors. And so they'll choose whichever one that they want to do and they receive the reinforcement, which whichever they want to do, based on which, whichever one they feel like doing, they'll receive reinforcement for that. So it's one or the other, one or the other, okay? Remember, these, these were each two separate behaviors. They weren't the same behavior. Completing 20 math problems and, and then reading for 30 minutes is two different things. Two schedules. FR20, FI30, two schedules, two different behaviors, they choose. Two schedules, two behaviors, and they choose. Does that make sense? Yes. 
That is the simplest way I know how to explain that. So if someone else doesn't understand, please say something and maybe someone else can offer another way that makes more sense. Okay, very good. Conjunctive. Okay, when you hear conjunctive, do you think of the word and? Because I do. That is one of the key words with conjunctive schedules of reinforcement. And, 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 conjunctive. In conjunction with music. In con we worked in conjunction with music. We, we did work and we had music at the same time. We just think of it in, with common sense. Like if you're talking in a sentence and you say in conjunction with, you're talking about and, right? Think about it like, generalize it like that. Um, same for alternative or alternatively, instead of walking around over there, you can read a book instead of, you know, or in, alternatively, instead of yelling at me, you can ask me nicely or th think of alternative as or. OK, so these key words are going to help you be able to discriminate. I feel like I try to make as many notes as I can about like con conditional discrimination with these sorts of concepts because it's going to be hard to remember everything but you need to know what for a fact can I can I remember about this thing that's going to distinguish it from other um schedules so for conjunctive um the key word here is and okay it's a compound schedule on which reinforcement is delivered when the requirement of both a ratio schedule and an interval schedule is met simultaneously or at the same time Example, I set a FI2 for two, FI2 minutes in an FR100 schedule. The rat must press the lever 100 times and press the lever again after two minutes goes by. So they had to do both things to receive the reinforcement. Pressing the lever 100 times and pressing it after the two minute mark. I combined two schedules and they both had to be met in order to receive the reinforcement. Okay, that's conjunctive. Alternative schedule, it's a compound schedule in which reinforcement is delivered when the requirement, either a ratio schedule or interval, sorry, ratio or interval schedule is met. The either or schedule with a ratio and the interval. So either one, they can meet either one they want to meet and they get the reinforcement. For some reason, I don't have an example for that. I think I meant to, but it got either deleted or I just forgot to do it. But um, can someone think of an alternative schedule example? Um. Mm. Would it be like either you wash the dishes or you do the laundry? Would that be? Um, let's see. Well, it's for. either a ratio schedule or interval schedule. So oh. let's see. More specifically with the laundry. <laughs> um, like if you fold a shirt um, or you um do let's see you fold a shirt or you sweep for 10 minutes okay yeah. whichever I one, have one. Do. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh you can uh you can say you can um you can have a break after you eat to read you can read 30 30 pages or you can read for 30 minutes Right. I like that. So yeah. either one, either one means that he'll get the reinforcement, right? Either yes. one that he chooses, he will receive reinforcement, whether he reads 30 pages or whether he does the other thing I forgot. Read for 30 minutes. Read, th yeah. read 30 minutes, yes. Yeah, so that's an alternative schedule. It's pretty simple, right? All right. So I know don't don't slap me for this, but I'm gonna scroll up. 
and I want to ask someone in the group to explain what is a concurrent schedule of reinforcement. Um, um, you're doing two things at the same time. You said the keyword is and, so you're reading and you're completing the question. I, concurrent, Maybe? concurrent, not conjunctive. Oh. Oh, okay. Hold on. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Um, concurrent is uh, okay. independently and simultaneously. Uh -huh. um, the client has has a choice between behavior. two behaviors. Mm -hmm. Um. Good. So and it's also combined with sister schedule. I don't have anything. There was two, I think two people talking at the same time. I'm not sure. All right, someone else was talking. Go ahead. I just, I just mentioned that that they have a choice and it's directly connected to matching law. It's governed by the matching law, which means um, behavior will go where reinforcement flows. Because I think whoever spoke first said everything else. Bingo. Yes. The so concurrent is going to be largely based on the matching law. So the matching law is going to be like your keyword here for concurrent. They're going to do whichever one they want to do more, right? Mm -hmm. Now, someone tell me about alternative schedule. <laughs> Okay, let me try. Let me try the alternative schedule. Okay, go ahead. The alternative schedule has um, is it has it deals with the compound schedules, and then mm -hmm. um either ratio or interval schedule, um to be met for for them to get the reinforcement, and then um um so an example would be um. You either read for thirty for twenty minutes or you do thirty pages or do 30 pages of reading. Right, alternative. Alternatively, you can do this, right? Yeah. Good. Someone give me an example of the conjunctive schedule of reinforcement. With conjunctive, they have to do both a ratio and interval. Um, and, yes. Uh, yeah, um, so both a ratio and an interval uh, requirement to get the reinforcement. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Someone give me an example of a chain schedule. The chain schedule is when the order matters, like doing a recipe, you have to go in order in order to um, be considered a chain schedule. Wonderful. Is there an SD with chain schedule, though? Yes. Yes. Are you sure? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Um, are you sure? SD. Yes. Each step is a, it's an SD for the there next an step. There's an SD for each step. Exactly. I was just <laughs> testing you. I was testing you. <laughs> is there a, yes. All right. What about tandem? Tandem is just the opposite. You oh, don't, okay. no order. And the order doesn't matter. Yep. Bingo. And no SD. Bingo. I like to run tests sometimes. I think it's kind of funny because like I'm trying to challenge you to be like, if someone's like, no, it's not, I'd be like, yes, it is. Like, yes, that is, you know, there's an SD with that. So you need to be confident. Like when this test comes up, don't be scared. Like when you see the question, I'm not, I'm gonna be like, you know what? I've worked my butt off to get here. I've studied all these terms. I'm not gonna let one little detail mess me up. So wonderful job. Um, let's scroll down. I think we covered most of them. Oh, we didn't do mixed. Someone give me mixed. What is that? Mixed schedule. Mm. The orders, yeah. everything, the orders, there's no order. Basically, you just do every, everything's given in different orders. I don't know. No, um, the mixed schedule is, um, there's no SD and the client doesn't know when it's coming. He can get uh, a reward after two bites of vegetables, or he can get a reward after five bites, bites of vegetables. He just has to eat his vegetables to know when he's going to get the reward. Boom. <laughs> you right on the head. Right on the head. Perfect. <laughs> That's what I love. 
people really just get it. Um, and then multiple, give me multiple. Uh oh, I got somebody on this. What's the multiple one? It's like two or more scheduled for the behavior presented. One behavior. Who said? Hold on. Who else said? You're on. You're just on a fire. You're like I'm on fire. I want to keep going. <laughs> um sorry did someone else want to add something to that for the um multiple schedule um for the multiple schedule each schedule is different from each other is that is that a question yeah i i just i, I thought that's that's one of the that's one way to understand that you know each schedule is different for example so the schedule about is different. yes the schedule is different but yeah. it's one behavior and there's two SDs. So different schedule, different yeah. SD, same behavior. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Different schedules, different SDs, one behavior. Remember how it was the math tutor and the math teacher? Mm -hmm. Two different SDs, but two but the same behavior of getting, you know, knowing the math pretty much, getting doing the math test. And then the score was what was different. They, the score for one was 12 out of 20. The score for the other was 17. So he had to do d two different scores uh, for two different teachers. So that was the that was the different. I remember um, it schedules. as a divorce. Sorry, what? I remember it as a divorce. That was it. Yeah, yeah, the divorce thing. All right. Um, I'm just... And that was for multiple schedules? Um, yes, that was multiple schedule example. Uh -huh. Yeah. And everyone's clear on the basic schedules, though, like fixed ratio, fixed interval, like the, the, the sister ones, the sister schedules. We're clear on those. Those are, like, pretty simple, I think, for most people. I was just thinking about a really good example for the... For the conjunctive schedule, I thought about mm -hmm. the, the BCBA exam, how you have to write for four hours, and then you have to answer 180 questions. You have to do both of them to pass. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, hold on. Sorry, I got distracted with something. What? All right. Um, sorry, I'm taking a little note. I'm trying to keep track of people that ask me stuff in the chat because once I, once I exit out of this meeting, um, it's just going to erase. So I was trying to make sure that I remember to do what after meetings over. <clears throat> take a take a another thirty seconds and just soak in all the schedules if you can. I'm going to move this up some more. Okay, I'm going to have to switch to another device because I'm losing time at this one. Okay. Is that Pam? Yes. Faye. Oh, Faye, yes. <laughs> Second. Uh, Marie, were you ever able to find, find the, um, spreadsheet, Maria? I don't know if she's still here or not. Yes, she is, but I don't think she can hear me. Oh, were you ever able to, uh, is your sound working? W were you ever able to find the spreadsheet? 
I was trying to make a note of who needed me to send them what. So um, at our break, I'm just going to take time um, to touch base with, okay, Tamara. Yes. Um, at five, stay for like a second, and then I will tag you in the post on Facebook. Same for uh, Tiffany, Maria, and Crystal. I will tag you all on the post at our break time, and then let me know if you still don't... Um, you still can't access it, but I will do that at a break time. And then Violetta, is it Violetta or Violetta? I don't want to say it wrong. All right. Um, okay. Great. So we're going to take a break in about three minutes, but let's keep rolling. Um, let's talk about positive. Okay, so B6, let me just back up. We did schedules of reinforcement, and now we're going to move on to B6 to defi define and provide examples of positive and negative punishment contingencies. Valerie, let me put that down. Valerie, I got your message. I will do that as well. All right. Um, define and provide schedule, <laughs> positive and negative punishment contingencies, excuse me. Positive punishment is the addition of a stimulus to decrease the probability or likelihood of a behavior occurring in the future. Again, punishment, discouraged. Punishment is discouraged. You don't want to see any more of that, okay? The positive part of punishment, the positive punishment is just the addition of a stimulus. If we talk about Negative punishment, it's the removal of a stimulus to decrease the likelihood that a behavior will occur in the future. So we don't want this to happen again. So we're taking something away, okay? So negative punishment, taking something away to decrease the likelihood. Positive punishment, adding something to decrease the likelihood. Positive punishment example, I gave Billy a look of disapproval for using a rude tone at the ice cream shop. And now he does not act rudely when we, whenever we go back to the ice cream shop. In fact, he even smiles and uses more manners. I decreased the likelihood that he would be rude because I gave him a look of disapproval. Okay, that was positive. Negative punishment example. I told Veronica she had to wait until next weekend to go to her friend's house since she skipped class at school today. Okay. So she couldn't go. I took away the, the, the chance for her to go to her friend's house because she skipped class. I don't want her to continue skipping class. So I took away her chances to go to her friend's house. That was the negative part. Now, there are some positive punishment and negative punishment interventions. Positive punishment interventions could be reprimands, response blocking, a contingent exercise. Some negative punishments could be um, overcorrection, timeout procedures, non-exclusion. So like non-exclusion as in like they're with the group, but they don't get to do something with the group. They just, they're just there. Whereas if I said exclusion, I'm removing them from the group where they won't where they will not receive any reinforcement at all. They're they're going to be punished because I'm putting them, I'm excluding them, and they're going somewhere else so they don't get to be a part of the group. And also response costs. When I say response costs, that could mean anything that's going to cost me for doing what I did. So let's say I 
was speeding and so i got a ticket that's response cost it costed me money and time because i was speeding and it's a punishment okay so response cost is really all about what does it cost the person for doing that thing and it's to decrease the likelihood that they'll do it anymore okay so we're going to pause right there We'll talk a little bit more about B6 um, when we come back from our break at 510 or 511. Right now, I will go ahead and send or tag the people that asked me to for the study guide on Facebook. So be looking at your notifications in the next second. I will be doing that now. Tiffany and Maria. Oh my God. Okay. Um, I have tagged Valerie, Crystal, Tiffany, and Maria on the post to buy the study guide it's going to just be above um and you just click the picture and it should take you straight there Yes, Tamara, I'll tag you right now.
hello everyone um i think i messed up the whole youtube live just now because i accidentally exited out of the freaking oh my god please tell me it's still going okay it is someone say something crap and it didn't erase the chats too that's okay at least i took notes um my screen is green i don't know why okay you aren't sharing anything on my end i can hear I you can't, i can't hear anything um Maybe I should leave and come back. Does leaving and come back because you're the um, person running the meeting, does that take everybody else out of it? Mm -mm. Okay. Am I still echoing to anyone? No echo here. Okay, good. All right, so we're gonna jump back and oh by the way, did everyone get their stuff sorted out? Like whoever wanted the study guide, I tagged you all um in the post on Facebook. So hopefully you got that. All right, cool. Let me share my screen. I am going to use. Oh my goodness, what in the world is going on? Um, where is my. Here it is. All right, I'm going to share my screen now. I'm going to transition from my Google Sheets to a Quizlet because only certain sections were filled in. I'm going to fill in all the sections, but I just don't have it all filled in right now. So I am going to share a Quizlet that has the same thing that I would probably just put anyways. <clears throat> but once I um, paste my um, tab into your Sheets whenever you buy it, or if you already have bought it and you shared it with me, I will put it in there complete. So don't worry about that. It might take another day or so, but I will be putting that in there. Or if you prefer just to, just to get what I already have, that's up to you. <clears throat> All right, let's look at B. I'm gonna zoom, zoom, zoom. All right, hopefully that's clear enough for you. Um, we are on, positive and negative punishment B6. So, great. So we're halfway through, almost halfway through B6, B, uh, section B, excuse me. All right, so we talked a little bit about um, what positive and negative punishment is. Uh, ultimately, we want to uh, decrease the likelihood that the behavior will happen in the future whenever we're referring to punishment. So, some examples. We already went over some examples, but here's another one. Um, removal of a known positive reinforcer contingent on behavior. A uh, reduction in the future frequency of responding as a result of the punishment operation. Uh, an example, uh, losing car privileges contingent on breaking curfew results in reduced rates of breaking curfew in the future. So I think we're pretty clear on that, hopefully. Move on to the next one. Where is my tab at? cannot find my tab because I have a million tabs open. Um, 
Where in the world is it? Oh, here it is. All right. Um, let's see. I don't think I like the way I can't see my task items anymore. Um, B7. Define and provide examples of automatic and socially mediated contingencies. Okay, so this is B7. And the first thing we're going to talk about is automatic contingencies. Okay, so automatic results directly from behavior. Some examples of automatic positive reinforcement is you turn on the faucet to access the water. You twirl, Lord, direct. You twirl around to produce sensory stimulation, and the twirling results in stimuli, sensory stimulation. So that was an automatic positive reinforcement that you received just from turning the water on and putting your hand in it. Okay. Negative automatic reinforcement is you put on noise canceling headphones to block out aversive noise. Okay. Another example is you scratch an itch to remove discomfort. That is automatic negative reinforcement. You did not need another person to get rid of your itch. You itched your arm and then it went away. You didn't need someone else. Otherwise, that's socially mediated if you did need someone else. Okay. Automatic punishment. Pain from stubbing your toe. I really wish this ad would get out. Pain from stubbing your toe or discomfort from wearing sandals in the snow. Okay, these are automatically occurring punishment examples. The above were automatically occurring positive and negative reinforcement. Are we clear on those, those concepts? This is the automatic examples for B7. Now, if we go to B7 for socially mediated tendencies, Okay, socially mediated means the reinforcement is delivered by another person. So these are not automatic. I needed someone else to receive the reinforcement. Example of socially mediated positive reinforcement. The teacher delivers specific praise and a high five when the child decodes a word accurately. Okay, accordingly, accurate decoding responses increase. An example of a socially mediated negative reinforcer is the teacher allows a child to take a break after accurately completing five math problems. Accordingly, rates of accurate math problems, math completion um, increases. So the teacher gave them a break. That was the negative stimulus. Sorry, does someone want to say something? I couldn't tell if that was someone saying hey or something like that. Um, this is pretty simple to understand, I feel like, versus when you compare the um, socially mediated versus automatic contingencies. Um, you may have also heard automatic during like a functional analysis lesson. Like if something is automatic, it could be sensory. Um, and so you might see high rates um, of problem behavior and all the other conditions of the functional analysis. So like you might see high rates of problem behavior in the escape condition. Um, you might see it in the attention condition. So people sometimes say like, yeah, it, might, it must be automatic or sensory because there's high rates of problem behaviors in all the conditions. And so there's no one problem condition. And so it might be automatic or sensory based issues. <clears throat> Examples of socially mediated punishment, a reprimand following swearing, loss of privileges for lying. So these are all socially mediated punishments. The parent was like, okay, you can't swear like that. You know you're not supposed to be saying that. That's a reprimand. The loss of privilege, the parent took away the privilege for lying. It didn't just automatically happen. The parent did that. All right, so is everyone good about B7? Yes. Great. Let's keep rolling then. B8, 
Define and provide examples of unconditioned, conditioned, and generalized reinforcers and punishers. Whew, okay. We're going to start with unconditioned reinforcers. Unconditioned means unlearned. We already went over this. And so remember, unconditioned, unlearned. It's automatic or it's reflexive. So let's turn this over. Unconditioned reinforcers refer to stimuli that function as reinforcers for all organisms due to phylogeny without prior learning. Compare, compare phylogeny to ontogeny. Ontogeny means that we learn it throughout our life, okay, based on reinforcement history and based on our life choices. That's on ontogeny or ontogenic. Phylogeny is like evolution. So think of phylogeny like Darwin, like Darwinism. It's just evolutionary. We just didn't really learn it during our life. We already had that as we already knew. We knew all that before someone had to tell us or we had to experience reinforcement or punishment or whatever for it. We just knew, okay? That's unconditioned. Examples of primary positive reinforcers. Primary meaning unconditioned. Primary is like automatically just there. Uh, primary positive reinforcers, food, water, air, sleep, sex, etc. Examples of primary negative reinforcers or aversive stimuli, pain, extreme temperatures, intense noises, or lights, etc. These are all unconditioned reinforcers. Next is unconditioned punishers. Unconditioned punishers, they function as punishers without prior learning. We know that. Examples include painful stimulation, intense sensory stimuli, loss of primary reinforcers such as food and water. Don't need to learn that losing food and water is a bad thing. We just need it. We want it regardless, and that's just how it is. Pain, we don't learn about pain, we just experience it. We know it's bad because it means that we may not survive and that would hurt our species development. Okay, so these are unconditioned punishers. We just talked about unconditioned reinforcers and now we just did unconditioned punishers. Now we're gonna go to conditioned reinforcers. Condition means learned. I condition you, I'm teaching you. Okay, also known as secondary. Conditioned reinforcers refer to stimuli that acquire the capacity to function as reinforcers for individuals as a result of pairing between neutral stimuli and existing reinforcers. Examples include a thumbs up, cans, stickers, only has a strengthening effect on behavior because it has been paired previously with an existing reinforcer. If praise reinforces already, thumbs up and praise will strengthen it. Eventually, thumbs up will work as a reinforcer by itself or alone because it was paired with the praise. Okay, so thumbs up could have once been very neutral, but it was paired with praise. And so now thumbs up equals praise, and now it's conditioned for the individual to to see it as reinforcing. Um, this sort of reminds me of fading or least to most, most to least. Um, whenever I just think of like, whenever you want a learner to be like not as, not as dependent on you praising and saying all these things and you could just give a simple thumbs up and it's like less work and it's probably more likely to last because it doesn't require as much praise um you're sort of fading out the necessity of the praise to give the person the reinforcer you could just give a thumbs up so it's more likely to last throughout time if we can sort of draw back the intervention that we initially start which is more you know intensive and we're maintaining it versus when the client leaves, you don't really want them to have to keep this intensive program going because then it just won't last. We want to fade back the, the more intensive um, things. 
or interventions. All right, condition punisher. We know what that is. It's a punisher that was learned through reinforcement history, right? So examples include reprimands, um, an error message, loss of secondary reinforcers, such as money, tokens, preferred tangibles, hearing the word no, like no, um, like maybe you do something and your parent tells you no, or you're touching something you're not supposed to, etc. Um, the word no would have a prior history with the learner that a loss of reinforcement will occur. So they've learned that hearing no is like, oh no, I'm about to get in trouble or something like that. Um, does that make sense so far? So, so far we've done unconditioned reinforcers, unconditioned punishers, conditioned reinforcers, and conditioned punishers. Now we're going to be moving on to generalized um, reinforcers and punishers. We're still on B8. All right. Examples of generalized reinforcers. They are effective across time and place as a result of pairings with many other reinforcers, such as money. You never get tired of making money. You love money because it's paired with so many other things. You don't really get tired of money. It's just reinforcing due to its wide pairing of just everything together. Um, access to a nice house, access to food, access to girls. If you know, if you're a rich man and you want a bunch of girlfriends and it's like, okay, when I have money, I get all these girls. So like, you, you get the point. Generalized, it's like, it goes with a lot, okay? Same for praise. We see, we get praise for all these different sorts of things. And so praise is very generalized as well. Tokens. Because it gains us access to other things. Praise has been a praise has been paired with many other good things in the past. Praise, praise, and you get something you want, physical attention, privileges, etc. Tokens money usually are paired with a wide variety of activities and items. Any questions? Or are we good to go? All right, we're rolling. Define and provide examples of generalized punishers. We're still on B8. Generalized punishers. Before I turn the card over, who thinks they can tell me what a generalized punisher example is? And what is generalized punisher? It's a punisher that's across all different environments. Yeah, it's happened. It's been paired with with many things, right? Mm -hmm. So someone, would you like to give an example of what a generalized punisher is? Mm -hmm. uh, would a uh, response cost be one of it? Um, response cost is a type of negative, uh, th th that's a, no, that's a, that's a condition punisher, I'm pretty sure. Okay, okay. No, that's, that's a type of negative punishment, but I don't know if it's generalized or is it condition. Mm -hmm. uh, Jolanda and Tamara, do you want to add something? Would a fine be generalized punisher? A fine? Yes, I think so. But it depends, though, like what kind of fine, because. Like a late fee added to your bill when you don't pay your bill on time. Yeah, I was I would think a late fee would be a great category for like a generalized like, yeah, like response cost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like response negative. Cost. Mm -hmm. negative. That's a negative punisher is a late fee. No, that's a positive punisher because you're at it because you have to pay money. Right. Right. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, they're taking wait, money no, from you. Taking money. They're taking, taking money from you. Taking money from you. Yeah. So you're taking negative. That's a negative. Because you lose, you lose money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a negative punisher, which is also um, a response cost. Mm -hmm. 
Jolanda? I can't I can't think of anything right now, but if I think of an example, I'll, I'll add on to it. Okay. All right. So social disapproval, reprimand. That's a very generalized punisher. Um frowning mm -hmm. at me. That's a generalized punisher because Many people can frown at you over your lifetime. Yeah. For a variety of things. And you would know that this doesn't feel good. So that's going to be a, ge a very generalized punisher. Um, if you're having trouble remembering examples in the future, just what has been paired with a lot that you don't see as something that you like? Like, what's, a, what's something that you don't like that's been paired with a lot? That's sort of like what you could ask yourself if you're trying to think about it. All right. That was B8. We feel good about B8. We're on B9 now. All right. B9. Define and provide examples of operant extinction. Operant extinction is withholding or discontinuing the reinforcement of a response. So you're basically just not giving that person reinforcement at all for that behavior. And eventually the behavior will go to pre-reinforcement levels. So like it never even happened. Um, although, you know, there's, there's spontaneous recovery, extinction break, et cetera, et cetera. But eventually, you know, the behavior will go to pre-reinforcement levels. Um, it's also a gradual reduction in responding as a result of an extinction procedure. That's another definition. Okay, so that's ex that's operant extinction. But we must actually we have to go over examples because that's in the task list. Let's just provide examples. Okay, I got an example. If I work from home, um, but Let's sit, look. How about this? I was working at the office, and I was getting all of my uh, client, my all my notes done on time, and everything. Like all my notes were done, turned in, everything. COVID came. I work from home, and then all my notes were not getting done on time because I was so comfy at home. And really, what I wanted was. I wanted to work to go home. Like I was at work doing my notes and I was like, oh my God, when I get home, I'm going to get a treat. I'm going to watch TV. I'm going to do all this stuff. And then when I started working from home, I had all that. I had the TV. I had everything I wanted. And then I stopped doing my notes because I didn't really care about being reinforced because I was already at home. And so my finishing my notes on time underwent operant extinction because I no longer really worked for those reinforcers because I was already at home. And so there was really no motivation for me to finish them on time anymore. Did that make sense to anyone? Hopefully it does. That's the way I like to remember it. Yes. Okay, good. Happy that that makes sense. Um, does any, is anyone not clear on operant extinction? All right. <clears throat> well, I guess we're still on B9. Uh, extinction of positive reinforcement, which is really a type of operant extinction. Um, we kind of just went over this. Like, there, there is no more positive reinforcement for the behavior. And so eventually, uh, the behavior just stops or reduces. Um, the behavior can still occur, but no longer followed by access to tangible activity or positive reinforcer. Another example is a child engages in swearing behavior. Excuse me. A child engages in swearing behavior to gain access to uh, parental attention. During extinction, the parent withholds attention contingent on swearing. Rates of swearing gradually go down. Okay. 
if the function of behavior is parent attention, this will be attention extinction. If the parent and child were in a conversation and the child swore, the parent did not acknowledge the swearing and just continued with the convo, they kept talking like the swearing never happened. You're not delivering attention, but you are not withholding all attention. That would be negative punishment. So I guess it was just giving an example of like how you wouldn't completely ignore the child. You just wouldn't address that specific thing. If you completely ignored the child when they swore, instead of just like ignoring the comment, you'd be implementing negative punishment instead of extinction. Can you explain that again? So in this example, it just gave an example of like negative punishment versus implementing uh, attention extinction. Because uh -huh. if, so the parent ignored when the kid would swear mm -hmm. or say a cuss word. And then instead of ignoring the kid talking all together and like delivering no attention, you just ignored the one comment. Oh, okay. If you withheld all of your attention, like let's say the child was talking to you and they say, oh yeah, oh shit, like cussing or whatever, and then you walked off and you like would not even look at them, you wouldn't do anything with them, that's negative punishment because mm. you took everything away. Okay. Versus attention extinction in this case was just like you're withholding the attention for that one thing. Mm. You're not giving them absolutely nothing after they swear. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I'm hearing that for the first time. I didn't know anything about that. I'm just like, wow, okay. About wh which one? Attention about, extension? Yeah, about the uh, the punishment. That's, that if you are actually ignoring the child and any other, you, you're actually ignoring all behaviors that is exhibited at that particular time, it becomes punishment. Rather than, rather than just uh, ignoring the one behavior that you really don't want. Right, because you were just focusing on that one thing. Mm -hmm. You're focusing on that one behavior. You're not focusing on them talking all together. Like okay. you just wanted them to not cuss. And so it's sort of like separating out them just talking to you versus them saying something you don't want to hear. Okay. Based on attention. Yeah. So you, you, you've teased it out. Okay. If I can re reword it that way. Um, extinction for negative reinforcement. This is still all operant extinction. This is uh, sub subtypes of operant extinction. So if I want to negatively, if I want to implement extinction for a negatively reinforced behavior, this involves preventing avoidance or escape from the relevant aversive stimuli in order to reduce response rates. This is escape extinction. So if a kid is trying to get out of work, they're, you know, you're going to keep presenting the task to them. That's escape extinction. You're not going to let them get out of the task. You're going to keep presenting it. It doesn't matter what they do. You're still going to have them try to do the work. So that's escape extinction. You want them to stop trying to get out of the work. An example here, a student engaged in destructive behaviors to escape from academic tasks. The teacher implemented ex escape extinction by immediately replacing destroyed materials and maintaining the expectation for the student to complete the task. Destructive behaviors no longer produce escape and gradually decreased. The student was given a new paper over and over every time, no matter how many times they ripped it up. Does that make sense? These are all different examples of um, different ways to put a behavior on extinction through keeping the expectations in place um, so that the person does not escape. And therefore you're putting their escape behavior on extinction. Okay, so Gosh, this is really long, um, B9. Sensory extinction, ooh. Sensory extinction involves blocking or masking the sensory consequences produced by a response in order to decrease rates of responding, maintained by automatic reinforcement. 
Examples. Disconnecting a light switch eliminates sensory consequences of repetitive flipping of the light switch. So disconnecting the light switch eliminates the sensory consequences for repetitive flipping of the light. All right. Another example of sensory extinction is the, uh, op the opiate antagonist naltrexone blocks endorphin receptors and may eliminate maintaining sensory consequences for some self-injurious behaviors. Helmets may reduce sensory consequences that maintain some forms of headbanging. Sensory extinction, helmets. We don't want them to feel that, 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 that sensory that they want from banging their head. We want to put the helmet on, that's sensory extinction. We don't want them to, to want to go ahead and keep banging their head because that's not safe. So we're going to put a helmet to implement sensory extinction for that. Assuming that's the actual reason why they're head banging in the first place. Um, another example is trying to spin a spinner on the desk for the sound. For sensory extinction, they carpeted the individual's desk and chair so that no sound would be produced. All right, B10. I really want to get to, I don't know, I, I don't know if we're going to make it. I really don't. All the way through E by, no, all the way through I by 7 o'clock. There's no way that I'm going to make it at this rate. I don't know what we're going to do, but maybe we just keep working and not take a break this time, and I'll just go faster, if that's okay with y'all. Um, or, or the next, like the next study session, just continue the task list and we get through what we get through. So everybody has an understanding because, you know, some of us struggle with some stuff. So instead of yeah. trying to rush, maybe just next time we have it, wherever we stop, we'll pick up there and get through what we get through for the next session. Yeah, yeah. I definitely want to get through. I just don't That's know. because I take my test Wednesday. I'm not doing any more sessions until like probably that saturday or sunday after so it would be like that next week all right well that's fine that sounds okay okay i'm gonna i'm gonna go don't faster to over, don't don't to over worn you out you know you have this exam coming it's not far away doing the whole yeah, time i don't want to wear myself out too much <laughs> yes it's, it's a lot yeah so i'm gonna like i said i'm gonna go as fast as i can yeah. But I think maybe we should just work through till seven and not take a break this time, if that's okay with y'all. Yes. Um, or if you still need a break, just go ahead and take it and then watch the uh, YouTube and go back and look at it. All right. B10, define and provide examples of stimulus control. Stimulus control occurs when the probability of responding is altered by antecedent stimuli situation. The likelihood of a response depends on the stimuli that are present. So something happens more when something is here versus when it's not. So I'm more, you know, when the red light, when the, the light is red, I'm stopped. When the light is not red, I'm going to go. My response is dependent on that red light or the green light. Okay. So that's stimulus control. It's an automatic. I'm going to see it. I'm, I'm under the control of the stimulus. When it's red, I'm going to stop. I'm not going to say, okay, red, that means go. I'm going to know for a fact that I'm under the stimulus control of red. I may not know it, but I'm going to respond as such. And I'm going to act accordingly to that, to that stimulus each time. Examples. Compliance with instructions is more likely in the presence of a regular classroom teacher than the presence of a substitute. Swearing is less, like, less likely to occur in the presence of a parent than in the presence of peers. <laughs> Stimulus control. Something is more likely to happen with someone and less likely to happen with someone else. Okay, so those are some examples. Saying red is more likely given the question, what color? Or whispering is more probable in libraries than in movie theaters. Uh, sorry, more probable in libraries and movie theaters than other environments. <clears throat> All right, B11, define and provide examples of discrimination, generalization, and maintenance. B11. 
All right, example of discrimination is only specific stimuli occasion responding. So it's kind of like a sign. This is, when, when you see this, this is what you do. That's the discriminative stimulus. This is a warning that reinforcement is gonna be available. The discriminating, or, well, that's a discriminative stimulus, but if you have discrimination, you can tell the difference between one and the other. So I don't wanna jump too far ahead, but that's discrimination is separating one thing from another and it's responding differently based on that specific stimuli, okay? So examples include a child labels only domesticated animals, sorry, a child labels only domesticated canines as dogs, lab, golden retriever, poodle, etc. Strong, tight stimulus control. A child hugs and kisses only close friends and family members. Mom, dad, brother, cousin, aunt, uncle. The child is discriminating these people as family members. And so that's a strong stimulus control. Whereas if he sees a stranger, he's probably not very likely to want to give them hugs and kisses, right? Because he's not normally with them. He's discriminated people that he's with a lot to a stranger who he does not know. He's going to act differently based on who he's with. Does that make sense? That's discrimination. I know I'm going fast, but I'm trying to make it. <laughs> All right. Um, still be 11. Define and provide examples of discrimination, generalization, and maintenance. This is generalization. Generalization is a wide range of stimuli with similar physical features, occasion responding. Example, a young child labels all four-legged animals as dogs. Even though that's not really true. Every four-legged animal is not going to be a dog, but they generalize four-legged animals as dogs. So the four-legged is going to be there. Okay, that's a dog. First time seeing a dog contacts reinforcement, but now every time they see a four-legged animal, they say dog. There's still some stimulus control, but it's weak because it's dogs and then other things similar to dogs that are controlling that response. Another example of generalization is a child hugs and kisses everyone. Not certain people, but everybody. First time kissing and hugging mom and dad, and they get reinforced, but now anytime they see a person, they expect to be reinforced by hugging them. There's still some stimulus control, but it's weak because all humans and they are similar. It because it's all humans and they are similar to mom and dad that are controlling that response. Are we still good? Yep. All right. I'm rolling. Maintenance, the last part of B11. Define and provide examples of maintenance. All right. AKA for maintenance is temporal generalization. Refers to the endurance of behavior change over time after intervention has been discontinued. Okay, so we want to aim for generalization whenever we're working with a client because we don't want them to just do it with us. We want them to go do it even when they're not with us. Okay, so teaching them in different environments is going to be a good thing to do. And then testing to see if they're still able to do the same thing, even though they're not with you. Maybe they're with another, maybe they're with their parent, maybe they're with the teacher. Are they able to generalize skills in the other environments or people, with people? Example, student learns to initiate greetings and continues to do so months and years after direct intervention ends. Okay. Maintenance. Oh, did I say generalization? I meant general, I meant maintenance, but you guys know what I mean. Maintenance is like it's maintained. So even after you've finished working with the client, they're gonna maintain the skill. I have a question on that. Yes. So how do you differentiate if you see a question, how do you quickly know it is generalization or it's maintenance? Well, maintenance is gonna be probably more so to do with continuing after a certain amount of time goes by when it's taught. That's going to okay. be like a maintained skill versus mm -hmm. generalization. It's going to mm -hmm. be more like 
think of it like as general, like it's gonna apply to many things. Uh -huh. Whereas maintenance is like how long. Okay. Okay. And do they keep doing it? Versus generalization is like based on what they see, based mm -hmm. on where they are, like are they gonna be able to do that skill? Okay. Not just like you know, for that one thing that you taught them. Okay. So generalization like right here is when the child named all the four-legged animals dogs mm. does that have anything to do with in different environments like over time like for a long time not really it more has to do with what the what the child is experiencing what you know what they're seeing uh -huh. it's like mislabeling almost whereas the maintenance is like does it keep going okay all right okay Thanks. Yeah. Define B12, define and provide examples of motivating operations. Motivating operations are antecedent variables that temporarily alter the value of a consequence and frequency of behaviors that have historically produced those consequences. All right. MOs include antecedent, antecedent events, operations, and stimuli that yield momentary influences on a three term contingency. Discriminative stimuli, responses, and consequences. So this is a little bit challenging. Um, a motivating operation is going to come before the antecedent. So we have typically, you know, our three term, which is the ABC antecedent behavior consequence. The MO is going to come before that because it's going to be putting in that that value factor, like. So what what am I likely to do or notice or or want as a result of the antecedent or as a result of what I want? That's gonna come before the antecedent. So you have MO and then you have the ABC. So let's just keep going. I don't want to get too lost in that, but um we have establishing operations and abolishing operations, right? So establishing would be number one, you have not eaten all day. You've been deprived of food. So this is an establishing operation. You, you have not eaten, so therefore you want food now, right? You really, really want something to eat. That's the value altering component. You really want it. You haven't eaten all day. You've been deprived of food. So now you're hungry and you want food. Now you're more likely to engage in the food seeking behavior. So it's a little chain here. The food deprivation is an MO that establishes or is an EO or sets up food as an effective reinforcer and evokes or triggers behaviors that have in the past produced food as a consequence. So this was all about an establishing operation. You hadn't eaten, you wanted something to eat. You're now more likely to engage in food seeking behavior. You didn't have any food, that was the establishing operation. And you know food is an effective reinforcer because food is awesome and you're programmed to want food. It evoked you to act in a way that got food. So that's what happened after you were deprived. Now you're gonna go and work, go get some food. You're working to do that. That's what your main concern is. Okay, you were evoked. All right, is an MO and an EO, are they the same thing? MO is the umbrella. EO and AO go underneath the umbrella. So you have okay. EO establishing and AO is abolishing. Okay. One of the other. Okay. If it's an abolishing operation. It's it's you've you've been satiated pretty right. much. Right. Okay. Whereas if it's an establishing operation, there's some sort of deprivation there. Okay. Okay. Because it's establishing the want or the need to go do that thing or, or whatever it is that you want. Okay. Okay, so if it's an abolishing operation, we're talking about an abative effect, abative, A-B-A-T-I-V-E, abative and abolishing go together, and then evocative and establishing go together. So if it's evoking something, that that's, go ahead and think about EO. And if it's abating something, then think about AO, which is abolishing operation. So if you consumed a large meal, 
Now you're satiated, right? Because you just ate. You really don't want to eat anymore, okay? Because you just ate. That's the value altering component here. You're now unlikely to engage in any more food seeking behavior because you just ate. You're not hungry anymore. Food satiation is an MO that abolishes or ends food as an effective reinforcer and has an abative effect on behaviors that have in the past produced food as a consequence. So we have evocative and abative, establishing and abolishing. Those are the four that fall under MO. All right. So MO is the whole term. Like that's like the umbrella term. And then we have the four underneath that have the EO and the AO. And then with the EO, you're having an evocative effect on the behavior. And then the AO, you're having an, an, an abative effect or abolishing. All right. I would slow down, but I want to keep going. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Um, define and provide example of rule govern behavior. This is a part of B13. Define and provide examples of rule govern and contingency shaped behavior. This is the first part of B13. All right, so rule govern behavior. It's a rule. You didn't have to experience the consequence to know that not to know to do it or not to do it. You just read it or heard it or someone told you, et cetera. So it's behavior learned without directly contacting environmental environmental consequences, behavior under the control of verbal antecedents. Examples, avoiding dangerous items based on parental teachings, putting your hand in the fire. They told you not to do it. And so you said, okay, you didn't have to put your hand in the fire and say, that's not a good idea. Someone already told you that. That's rule governed behavior. The fact that you did not put your hand in the fire. You could have learned this from actually trying it and burning yourself, but many of us don't touch fires because we are told it will hurt, it causes pain, so we don't do it. We believe our parents. It's a rule. All right, contingency shaped behavior. Learned by experiencing the consequences directly. Someone did not say, don't ride your bike and talk at the same time. You learn by riding your bike and talking that maybe it wasn't a good idea. Maybe you wrecked. Doesn't really give an example here for that, like specifically based on what happened after they were speaking and writing. But let's just say that, you know, you were distracted and you were talking and then you wrecked. <laughs> No one told you not to talk and ride your bike. You just figured out that it wasn't a good idea. Okay. So when you're an infant and you start speaking, you receive attention from adults around you. That's learned. When I babble and talk and do all this stuff, I get attention from the adults and they cuddle me and all that. That's a contingency shaped um, behavior. It's also operant learning too. If you want to relate it to other concepts, you could relate it to um, operant conditioning. If you want to relate the riding a bike and falling off, that's conditioned punishment. Um, yeah, so you can relate this to a lot um, of things. All right. B14, define and provide examples of verbal operants. Oh, I love these because there's a lot of them and there's a lot that goes to it. Actually, I'm going to pull up. Um, well, I'll read this first, but I'll pull up something else that has it more um, organized. One second. All right. Is everyone okay? I've been talking a million miles an hour, I know. I'm good. I'm good. All right. Okay, good. Hopefully you're still learning. I know I'm not, it sucks, but I probably should have planned for seven hours for this thing, but I didn't want to plan it too long because that's just too much for someone to sit through. 
You're doing good. Thank you. Um, all right. So define and provide examples of verbal operants generally refers to skills that are required for communication. It includes all behaviors that are that are reinforced through the mediation of another person with an appropriate learning history. Examples, or these are the verbal operants, with some that are excluded, but most of them are here. Uh, mans, tax, echoics, interverbals, textual, and transcription. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen for a more uh, comprehensive look at the verbal operants. I have some notes here. Verbal. All right, here it is. All right, so hopefully y'all can see this. I'm gonna zoom it in. Um, where is the oh, file review? Full screen. And perfect. So. Let's go over this really quickly. Um, where was it at? Mm. Oh, we don't have time for that. If you're wondering about where to read verbal behavior, scroll, huh? down. scroll down and you'll come I, back. I'm, I'm looking at this. I'm looking at, I was going to say, um, if you want to look at Cooper, chapter 25, you'll find verbal behavior, verbal operants there if you want to look at that as additional notes or reading up. Um, we don't have time to go through all that, but you already read that. Uh, verbal behavior is defined by the function of a response rather than its form. The speaker gain gain access to reinforcement and the listener reinforces the speaker the listener not only plays a critical role as a mediator of reinforcement for the speaker's behavior but also becomes an sd for the speaker's behavior all right let me scroll down to the more understood stuff <laughs> i think this is just too much for this video um, all right so a mand. Mand, think about it as like a request that it's, it's under the function of an MO. So I want something. That's my MO. And that's why I'm going to mand. That's why I'm going to ask for what I want because it's I have an MO. I know what I want. Okay. Early mans are known as crying. So the child is crying because they want something. They want to be held, milk, they're wet, whatever it is. Um, attacked is a verbal operant in which the speaker names things and actions that they, that the speaker has direct contact with through the senses. It's under the control of a nonverbal stimulus. I don't know if the exam is going to ask you this, but it's worth knowing what is each verbal, what is each verbal operant under under the control of because you should know that if it says which of the verbal operants is under the control of an mo you need to know that it's a man there's no other verbal operants that are under control of an mo it's the only one so a another verbal operant is an echoic echoic is pretty much you repeat the exact same thing back Control oh, by sorry. sorry, go um, ahead. I was gonna sorry, I was gonna answer your question that you said you didn't know. Um on my exam, it did ask that question. Yes, it did. Oh, what yeah. is it under the control um, yeah. of? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so and I and like, I'm not heard... in specific words, but like very similar to what you're saying. Okay. So everyone take notes right now if you're not Taking notes, take notes on the verbal operands because this is probably something that could cause you to fail if you fail enough of the questions on it. I don't know how many it's going to be, but don't let this be the reason why you don't pass. Um, this would fall under B. Yeah, section B. 
I don't know how big B is. I think I put it in the on the page. Hold on, the other day. So go ahead and look at that really quickly. I want to see how many questions is in B. Because I know you can't get below 80%. Oh, yeah. So there are 32 questions in in um in section B. Section B. 18% of your exam is going to be on B. So if you don't know many things in B, there's a chance that you might fail because it's such a large portion and you can't fail one portion or you fail the whole thing. That's what I heard. So 32 questions, 18.29% uh, is going to just be on B. The next biggest section is going to be uh, G, which is 35 questions. It's 20% of your exam. But I'm not stressed because I know we're all going to learn this and get it right the next time that we test or the first time. Whoever is not tested yet, you're going to know it before then. Um, so let's keep going. Tact. Well, we did tact already. Echoic. The speaker repeats the verbal behavior of another speaker. They repeat the echo. Controlled by a verbal discriminative stimulus or verbal SD. Has no point-to-point -point correspondence and formal similarity with the response. It ha I'm sorry, it has point-to-point -point correspondence. Lord, my computer got so dark. So point-to-point -point correspondence means that it's like the same, like it uses the same sense mode, I'm pretty sure. Does someone want to correct me on that? Does, doesn't point-to-point -point correspondence means the same sense mode? Yes. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that's what I mean when I say point-to-point -point correspondence is the same sense mode. Informal, informal similarity with the response. So it might look the same or like be similar in, in the way that it's presented or returned or responded. The way the response looks, I'll say that. I need to stop putting a bunch of extra words in. Um, so again, a coic controlled by a verbal SD has point to point correspondence and has formal similarity. Okay. Attacked has a non verbal SD. All right. MO, uh, MAND has an MO as its functional control. It's under the functional control of ML. Does it mention anywhere with a nonverbal SD, verbal SD? Nothing. It's just about MOs. Okay. So we we went over three so far. So we have M, T, and E, man, tact, and echoic. Continuing with echoic, produce praise. Motor imitations have the same verbal properties as echoic behavior, as demonstrated by their role in acquisition of sign language by children who are deaf. So you can have someone speak in sign language and it's like a coic because they're basically repeating. They're just copying you. It's like a motor imitation. Copying a text is a form of verbal behavior in which a written stimulus has point-to-point -point correspondence and verbal similarity with the verbal response. So you could copy a text and it could be similar to an echoic because it's the same thing it's your it's the exact same thing that they're doing copying all right intraverbal occurs when a occurs when a verbal sd evokes a verbal response that does not have formal similarity nor point to point correspondence when i say does not have formal similarity and does not have point to point correspondence, it is not copying them. It is a vastly different response. So think of it as a conversation. You ask me, what is my favorite ice cream? I'm not going to say, what is my favorite ice cream? I'm going to say, it's chocolate because I'm going to be talking to you normally. I'm not going to repeat what you said. There's no point to point correspondence with that. There's no formal similarity. I'm not going to copy you or be evoked by MO or need a certain, it's just a verbal SD. You ask me a question 
and I gave you a verbal response and I answered your question and it was in the form of a conversation. That's introverbal. Introverbal yeah. and conversation go hand in hand. That's what you're going to remember as introverbal. It's a convo. We want kids to be using the introverbal um, language more than we do a coic and all that. Because we want them to be able to talk to other people and get to know them and, you know, be in, be in a normal classroom, whatever they're doing. We want them to be able to answer questions coherently and, and respond to, to, to a verbal SD properly. Okay, so answer questions as well as we think and talk about events that are not physically present. That's another part of the introverbal is like that's that's going to make it more of a conversation. Then it's going to make it like I need to be here just to know what to say or I need you to tell me what to say. It's just they're talking and they're responding to you. So let me just stop for a second. Which ones are evoked by a verbal SD so far? Um, echoey, intraverbal, uh huh. So, so far, those two echoey and intraverbal. And which ones have nonverbal, a nonverbal ST? MO. Tact. A demand. Tact is nonverbal uh, ST. Demand and tact. Mm -hmm. No. Um, no. man is man oh. is evoked is under the functional control of an MO. Uh -huh. So the question was, which of them, which of the verbal operands are evoked by a non-verbal SD? The answer was tact that we've done so far. Mm -hmm. It's tact, yeah. Okay. So so far, what's evoked by a verbal SD is introverbal and it coic. Okay, coic. Okay. The tact is is a nonverbal SD. Non We're just labeling. We're just labeling. We don't need someone to ask us a question. We're just labeling something. Tacting is labeling. Okay. And then the man is just asking for what you want. It's it's based on what you want, based on an MO, right? MO, yeah. motivating my motivation. I was hungry, so I asked for something to eat. That's it. Okay, so textual reading without any implication that the reader understands what is being read. Need to fix that. That's a verbal operant, reading. There's no indication that they understand, but they're just reading it. Now, the question is, well, did I mess up on this because how are these evoked, textual and transcription? Mm -hmm. I don't think. They're evoked by a verbal, um, a verbal stimulus. Yeah, so I meant to put that um, here mm -hmm. in this, this chart here is telling me, yes. So I didn't put it here, but it's here. Um, a verbal stimulus, both verbal SDs, textual and transcription, they're both evoked by a verbal SD. Okay, so which ones are evoked by verbal SDs again? Echoing, intraverbal, textual, and transcription. Exactly. Which one is evoked by a nonverbal SD? Tact. Um, tact. Tact. The tact. And which is evoked by MO? Man. Man. Exactly. Okay, so. Let's get this memorized, memorize it. Don't just wait. Okay, so this is how they're evoked here. And then this is the properties. So we said a coic has point-to-point -point correspondence, formal similarity, interverbal, no point-to-point -point correspondence, no formal similarity. It's a conversation. You're not copying me, you're talking to me regularly. Textual. Reading, okay, it's evoked by a verbal SD, has point to point correspondence, no formal similarity. Can I just ask a quick question? Point yes. to point correspondent, would that be duplic or no? 
Uh, you might have got me on that because I think I put that down here. I got to look at it. Yes, I think that's Duplex. Because I kind of, I, I was studying the terminology and Duplex keeps coming to mind when you say point-to-point -point correspondence on a response. So I was just wondering yeah. if I'm thinking differently or, or not. I'm not sure. Let me let me see um, where it's Duplex. Duplex has formal similarity and point-to-point. But I just want to know if it has to do with verb or operating, or I'm thinking I need it is. to yeah. redirect it. Okay, it is. Okay. Yeah, no, you're right. It has to do okay. with verbal operant. I just, okay. yeah. Hold on one okay. second. Do, hold on. Where was that? Verbal. I have to search all these documents. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Yeah, let me get to duplicate in a second. And, um, okay. In autoplay, yeah, those are the two that I got in. Okay. So, all right, where was that? With uh, transcription, evoked by verbal SD, point to point correspondence without formal similarity. So, textual and transcription are very similar, as you can see. They're almost the exact same, except textual means reading and tra transcription means taking dictation or writing or spelling words. that are spoken. So the fact that the writing the words that are spoken, that's the verbal SD right there, that the fact that they're being told to you, and so you're writing them. All right. Now, this is when it gets a little more complicated. And I'm really sad that we didn't really get to even experimental design because I love experimental design so much. Um, we only have 40 minutes left. So, let's see. Where was that? Let me go back to the Quizlet. Or maybe I should stay on this because it gives more detail. Excuse me. Um, one second. Um, verbal operants is one of those things where it's like, oh my God, it's so much. Um, so let's talk about tact extinctions real quick. Tact extinctions, extensions, excuse me. So if we have a generic extinction, it's the novel stimulus shares all the relevant or defining features of the original stimulus. This is stimulus generalization. That's like if I call Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts, the same thing. Like if I say um, coffee shop and I'm talking about Starbucks and I'm talking about Dunkin' Donuts. I've generalized those two because they share very relevant features. They sell coffee, but they're two different names. Okay. So that's like calling all coffee shops. Well, I don't know if it's if you call all coffee shops Starbucks or if you just call Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts coffee shops. I don't know which one is more correct. But in any case, you're generalizing based on the defining uh, and relevant features of the original stimulus. So I'm pretty sure it would be like if I said Dunkin' Donuts and Starbucks are coffee shops, and I'm just going to call them coffee shop. Someone want to correct me on that, or am I like saying what it is? I just say the name of the place that I'm going. If I'm going to Starbucks, oh, I'm going to Starbucks. I don't know. Right. But if someone didn't say that, um, then would I guess that be it was generalization. Well, I we were teaching that to one of our kids, and he wouldn't say coffee shop, but he would just say, oh, I'm going to Dunkin' Donuts to have coffee. So I guess he generalized coffee with the setting of the environment. Right. I don't know. Um, let me pull up generic um, tack, I mean, generic extinction, just because I want to make sure that I'm saying this correctly. Because I know it's when you label a, like a bunch of things one thing. 
generic extinction. So we may see a red car and still say car, as well as see a white car and still say car. Different makes and models of cars will all evoke the same response as car. So yeah, so if you see a bunch of different coffee shops like Dunkin' Donuts, Starbucks, you're just gonna say coffee shop. Does that make sense to everyone? You're just putting them all under one yeah. category because yeah. uh -huh. they're related. Yeah. Okay, with metaphorical extinction, uh, the novel stimulus shares some, but not all of the relevant features associated with the original stimulus. So metaphorical extinction, Lord, that's not, oh my gosh, this is getting really challenging. Um, let me look it up. Let me, let me look up an example of that. Metaphorical extinction. I should have taken more detailed notes for this. No, I think your notes are pretty good. Like using a metaphor, using mm -hmm. like or as. Um, your heart is as cold as ice. Yeah. Attacked, evoked by a novel stimulus. Well, I already read that. Um, some examples would include the test was easy as pie or time as money. So the metaphor exemplifies the term so like it's related but it's not exactly what it is pretty much they share relevant features but it's not the exact stimulus so another one is let me look up another one where did my other notes go that i had i don't know where I had a bunch Would that of these. Like break a lake kind of situation. Like so instead of saying good luck, break a lake. Is that what we're referring to? Mm. Kind of. I don't know. Um, one second. Okay. A uh, girl hears a car go by outside and says, fast. That's terrible. Mm. Person sees a tree and says, bush. Woman smells bacon cooking and says, and woman smells bacon cooking and says, bacon. Child sees a large M and says, McDonald's. Uh, boy sees a bear cub and says, doggy. I don't think I like any of those examples. Um, a child is taught to label a green snake as a snake. Later, the child sees a garden hose and says snake. So the novel stimulus was similar, but it was missing some of its defining features. Mm -hmm. Okay. So maybe like maybe like calling Starbucks Duncan. That makes more sense. Mm -hmm. So, like, if I go to a Starbucks and say, "Yeah, so uh, I'm at Duncan, right?" Like, no, you're not. You're. It's similar to Duncan, but it's not Duncan. That's what I'll go with for that. Um, where was I at here? For a metonymical extinction, the verbal responses to a novel stimuli that share none of the relevant features of the original stimulus configuration but some irrelevant but related feature has acquired stimulus control. Um, that's a really long definition, but an example could be uh, your friend calls paper money dead presidents. Uh, a child upon seeing a birthday cake says present. Stimulus was paired. Um, by them, I guess, getting presents in the past when they saw a cake. So they said present when they saw the cake. Um, a person talking about a SWAT team says the guns are on the way. That's a metonymical extinction. E extension. And lastly, a child calls lightning thunder. 
that's an example of a metonymical extension. So it's kind of like similar, but not exactly similar. It's just kind of close. All right. Um, soul stick extensions. When a stimulus property that is only indirectly related to the tact relation evokes the substandard verbal behavior, such as malaprops. So let me pull up an example of soul stick. A child watching a nature show says tigers are prey to zebras. That's not really that good. Um, let's see. I'll look up another one. Soul stick. Extinction. You pick up a new perfume and say it smells sweet. Um, saying refrigerator when shown a picture of a kitchen. Saying White House in the place of president. Does that make sense so far yeah. for the meta for the uh, soul stick? Excuse me. Wait, wait a minute. No, I did not just confuse that with soul stick. And metonymical. Oh, these one, these give me a headache. I don't know about y'all, but this is really hard. It's getting confusing. Um, That's what it is. Yeah, it's just really hard because like the yeah. notes mm -hmm. aren't exactly the best. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to pull up examples. I would encourage you after this to go back and look at all the verbal operants and look at examples of them, how they're evoked and the different tact extensions. That's going to be really helpful to you to go back and just spend some time on those. It's not going to be enough for us to like fly through mm -hmm. them. Um, like I really want to like dig deeper in them, but it's just not enough time. So trying to find one more example of a soul stick tact extinction so that means okay when you're talking about solace right are we so saying, I, I always say but i don't want to say it wrong anyway <laughs> so uh, so once they learn the tact, so we're talking about generalization here, right? When you talk about the extension after that? Um, oh, we're wait, I'm sorry. 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 One more time. Like, I know we're going to the tact extensions and all that, but we're talking about already a base generalization. If they see something, they should automatically gravitate to Gra say what they will really the relation between what they learn to what they see right they're like basically the association mm -hmm. the different associations of a stimulus that's pretty okay. much what tax stations are yeah. is you're mm -hmm. labeling them differently mm -hmm. and there's different ways to label them mm -hmm. so the the solistic the metonymical metaphorical mm -hmm. and generic yes. are different ways of associating mm -hmm. stimuli okay, okay. Right. They're the, they're they're related to the verbal operants, but they're just the different ways that you can label. They're just different and the like the endpoints, right? Like the little ends of it, kind of thing. Right. right? Like what okay. you ultimately what you come like what what your conclusion is based on the stimulus. Like okay, how you how did you relate these two things together? How did you get them confused? Because you use you know a tact extinction like that was a gen that was a generic extinction mm -hmm. that wasn't exactly correct but it was a type of labeling which okay. you were trying to say but it was just off a little bit okay, okay. so these are like the types of ways you could be off from the mm -hmm. actual thing that it is mm -hmm. all right okay. so all right let's go ahead and move on to B fifteen. Define and provide examples of derived stimulus relations. Unless y'all want to do the autoclitic and the uh, duplic. We didn't really get to that. Whatever works for you guys. Um, 
there's just so much with verbal opera. Like, there's no way I'm going to be able to cover all this. Even if I did an hour and a half long, like, session, like, I still don't think I'd be able to cover it. So just go back and look at all the verbal operands and then um, the sub, the subs, like the subsections of each one. Let me find the stimulus relations. All right. So this is B15. Define and provide examples of derived stimulus relations. Derived stimulus relations are relations that are not trained or explicitly taught. When several prior relations are made, new connections are made. Example, if you know three spoken equals three written and three spoken equals three objects, you can create the connection that three written is the same as three objects. Symmetry and transitivity both use this. Okay, so we have different types of derived stimulus relations. Now, this one doesn't do a very good job of covering the different aspects of it, but I will look really quickly at my notes. Derived really quick. All right, I'm going to pull up this example here. Zoom in. So, derived stimulus relations. This is B15. Definition, a relation between two or more stimuli that is not directly trained and not based on physical properties of the stimuli. If A, B, and C all correspond to the same thing, and only A, B, and B, C are directly trained, the relation between A and C is derived. Okay, so example in everyday context. A person taught that the spoken word dog, which is stimulus A, corresponds to an actual physical animal, which is stimulus B. The person also learns that animal, that the animal corresponds to the word chien, which is in French. Um, I guess that's dog in French, which is stimulus C. The relationship between dog and chien was never directly taught. It was derived. So A equals C in this case. We went from A to B, B to, to C, and now we have A, B, and C. But then really the, the derived relationship was from A to C because it skipped B. Okay? So that's the goal. That's the, that's the transitivity in this. Example in a clinical context, a client is taught to read and makes connections between the written word truck and the real physical truck without having been directly taught this connection. Relations were derived between A and C through the following learning. The written word equals spoken word. And the spoken word equals the physical object, which is C. So, Written word A equals spoken word B, and spoken word B equals physical object C. Okay, so why does why do derived stimulus relations matter? They can be used to teach complex verbal behavior as well as treat emotional and behavior problems. We don't really do the emotional problems with ABA, but we do the behavior problems. So if you're looking at how else to apply this, go ahead and make a note to go back and check um, into derived stimulus relations. And as always, the goal with 
derived stimulus relations is the transitivity. So there's there re, there's reflexivity, there's symmetry, and transitivity. Those are the three main ideas under derived stimulus relations. We want transitivity. Okay, so think about that. So for that one, we have to reach transitivity to get derived relation. Is that yes, what you transitivity is the ultimate end that you want. Okay. Okay. A to C okay. means transitivity. Okay. You could get A to A is reflexivity. And then A, B to B, A is symmetry. Mm -hmm. And then A to C, A equals C e is mm -hmm. transitivity. Transitivity, okay. So that's how you sort of work your way from reflexive to, tra to, to transitive. And most of the time when you take, I've taken the test and they ask you, they give you the relation of what's taught and you've got to figure out what was derived or mm -hmm. not, or, and it, and it, I don't know if you've ever seen the one um, YouTube on it where it teaches you to draw out the triangle just to uh -huh. show have you seen that one no but i can pull it up yes i've seen that's it. an excellent one if you're mm -hmm. taking that test know that inside and out she gives you four questions that are uh almost identical to how it's going to be presented to you so you really have to know those concepts okay can you put that in the chat for everyone to have access to by chance yep, or I at will. least just yeah. name it just name it I just put it in there. She does an unbelievable job of just having you draw that triangle. If you can get that down, you'll get the answer. Okay. Thank you so much. That is such a valuable uh Oh, you're welcome. That helped me so much because that's a hard one to, to understand. Yeah. I brought it up here. I don't know if it's sort of similar to... uh it, it is exactly the cookie one is exactly what she shows you to do so you've got to you've got to then draw the triangle on your whiteboard and say what was taught what was derived and, what, and then they're going to ask you what was missing so you got to so, find so you're going to have to find either symmetry reflexivity or transitivity because they're going to give you a scenario of uh sammy was taught to say the word cookie and match it to a cookie and then sammy was taught to um match the cookie to the, picture. the written word cookie mm -hmm. they're going to like give you that kind of wording and you got to figure out which part of that triangle it's a puzzle you got to figure out what's missing okay so does everyone see this and how you might find the derived relations versus the trained relations mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, the one thing that. I saw on the test that I got with that question was um, oh making sure that you're looking for the word derived. So if it was derived, then it would be transitivity. But if it was not, then it would be symmetry. Right. If it's taught, it's not derived. Mm -hmm. right. So that was the one. Yeah, like it's the key word. So making sure like you're doing all your work in the question first before you choose your answer. So that's how they trick you on that one. Yes, mm -hmm. just draw, draw the triangle and draw draw the triangle with the solid lines and then go mm -hmm. through each qu mm -hmm. part of the question and draw the dotted lines and then whatever part doesn't have the dotted lines. You'll see in the YouTube I posted, she shows you so clearly how to figure it out. Okay, thank you so much. Well, welcome. let's take a minute to look at this together um just as a quick discussion reflexivity we see at the top here a equals a cookie equals cookie right and then we're gonna go to a equals b b is down here cookie this cookie here equals the word cookie the word cookie equals the physical cookie this is symmetrical it's symmetry a b a b equals b a that's that's symmetry right do we get that trained derived 
I'm not going to talk about derived yet, but I'm just working. I want to just work my way down really slow. A to B, B to A is, sim is symmetry. Now, symmetry here again. B equals C, C equals B. Cookie equals food. Food equals cookie. Okay. So I'm working my way around the triangle. I started up here and I went to B and now I'm working my way to C. Now, derived, this is the only side of the triangle that has all dotted lines. The other two sides has the filled in lines. These are trained. Okay. So we have physical cookie to the word cookie. The word cookie to the word food. And now the transitivity is A equals C. Physical cookie is food. This is a derived relation. So we worked our way all the way around. We good on that? Or in, at least until you watch the YouTube? Yeah, that is good. All right. At first, you know, I actually didn't notice that this was the only side with just dotted lines. This is the only side of the triangle with dotted lines. The other mm -hmm. two sides all have solid lines, which means straight lines. Yeah. And that's exactly how you'll get the correct answer. Like if you model that triangle, mm -hmm. you'll you'll get that correct. Okay. It helps so much. Mm -hmm. Yep. I love that. That's that's great. I'm glad I found that picture too. Um, where was I at? Okay. Now we just finished B15. Now for C. In the last 15 minutes, I don't know how far we're going to get, but we're losing people minute by minute. If you have 60 minutes left, um, I guess they got bored or they're tired of me talking the whole time. But um, where was that? Oh, let's look at one more example. Let's look at one more example of a derived stimulus relation. I don't know if y'all want to or not, but I think it's probably a good idea. It's a good idea. Um, let's see. All right, now, let me look at this. Notice that the dotted lines this time are on a different side of the triangle. Mm -hmm. But the dotted lines still have transitivity because that's, that's mm -hmm. the derived relations, right? Mm -hmm. So let's just try to work our way around the triangle again, okay? So A, equals a would be let's see. um hold on reflexivity right there. hold on i'm trying to figure out how to, oh a equals a is this a is a. Mm -hmm. right this mm -hmm. is this is this is the reflexive it's a mm -hmm. is cat equals cat mm -hmm. and then it, we want symmetry next so mm -hmm. We want the physical cat and the word cat. Oh, wait, what? I'm, I'm confused. Why does, it just, why does it just say animal or like something like that? Like what? Why is it the, 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 the transitivity something else? I'm confused. Yeah, that's it. Uh, well, because that first example you pulled up is not a traditional example. You're better off watching that YouTube. That, that food part is kind of a um a unique one to do this one that you see in front of you with the cats is the more traditional where the reflexivity is the perfect match of cat to cat and then the symmetry is the cat to the word cat and then the word cat to the spoken word cat is the transitivity oh, is that a spoken the one word that has cat yes. on there is more like if you had a flashcard with the word cat on there right one you is the this is word. verbal operant so you have to think it's just bolded and not bolded 
yeah if it just imagine that the word cat would be a flash card with the word cat because it's you have to think that the individual is tacting the word cat right and oh. then the other one is the spoken word cat when they see a visual image of a cat right exactly okay so that's the transitivity there is when they speak it when they are presented with the card the word yeah so if they're presented with the flash card mm -hmm. and they say the word cat then transitivity occurs if they say the word cat and go backwards to that flash card of the cat mm. right okay so we have the reflexive physical cat is physical cat we have the symmetrical which is the actual cat and the word cat a a equals b b equals a and then we have the derived the, the derived which is the uh the That's word it. cat and spoken out loud is the same as cat and they know that a cat the physical cat and the word cat and the there spoken you. word cat mm -hmm are all the same right yeah. yeah exactly okay so that makes sense now the dotted indicates the train relations uh, uh no no the derived relations and the solid lines mm -hmm. are indicating trained correct trained. yep you got it so don't look at it for one don't look at it on one side and say oh yeah it's on this side so no don't do that because i almost did that just now no, it has nothing to do with the sides. Yeah, nothing to do with the side. Don't look at certain sides. Draw. You just have to draw it in. You have to Make draw it in. Yeah. All right. So, um, where was I at? Oh yeah. Let me exit that out. We're on C now. <laughs> I thought we were getting way farther than this, but that's okay. I must have been talking too slow. It's a lot. You're doing uh, a good job. It's you're a doing lot. A good job. It's a lot. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. So let me go to my other Quizlet. We have let's do it for about five more minutes, and then we'll take the last five to wrap up. Whatever we need, questions, whatever people need from me, or y'all want to talk for a second, we'll take the last five minutes doing that. But let me pull up C, and then I guess we'll just resume where we left off the next time that we meet up that'll be the plan which is most likely next sunday um let's see all right share this tab instead all right C1. This this is this is section C or well category C, task item C, however you say it. Measurement, data display, and interpretation. C1, establish operational definitions of behavior. Whatever the behavior consists of. It's everything observed and measured is what can be seen. So you're given an operational definition, exactly what the behavior looks like. Okay. What if I asked you, how do I know somebody is stealing? I would write a definition and I would say, this is how you know if they're stealing. If they put something in their pocket and they leave the store without paying, I'm not going to just say stealing. Well, what does stealing look like? Is stealing putting something in your pocket and that's it? No, because they didn't leave the store. Stealing, it means taking something and leaving the store. So that's why operational definitions are important because you, you need to be specific about what the person needs to look out for and what you're going to change uh, or, or how you know something is happening. Um, examples, we don't have time for that, but we'll see. Let's see, scenario, I spelled scenario wrong. Scenario involving the target behavior. That's giving an example of an operational definition of what the behavior looks like. Non-example, you always want to give a non-example. What does the behavior not look like? So that's how you know if the person is counting the wrong thing. This is what the, the behavior is not. Oops. C2, 
distinguish among direct, indirect, and, pro and product measures of behavior. Direct is measuring a behavior itself. You're not asking what happened. You're going to look at it yourself. Okay? Even if it's being recorded, you're still looking at it yourself. If I ask someone what happened, that's an indirect. A type of rect is permanent product. What was the effect on the environment? Emptying the dishwasher, that's a permanent product. I was able to see that the, the dishwasher was properly emptied at the end of them doing their chores. I could look at it and I can tell. Looking at homework, looking at a spelling test, that's permanent products. Okay? Indirect measurement. There's more types of direct measurement, obviously, but that's just one example. Um, indirect measurement. Measuring a behavior that differs from target behavior. So an interview, a checklist, that's all indirect. Um, what else? Assessment, anything like scale, putting it on a scale, like you're asking about it, that's indirect. Product measures um, is any behavior that is measured by a permanent effect it has on the environment. It's tying into C2. All right, this is going a little bit too fast, but it's not really thorough. I don't like this one too much. Um, this was a C3 measure occurrence, which is count, frequency, rate, and percentage. So we're not going to go into that because we're not going to have time. But what we did cover was A1 through C2. So we got like halfway, a little less than halfway through. Um, I will make a note where we stop that. Does anyone want to say, talk about anything um, for the last three, four minutes? Yeah, I just want to, um, I'm going in for my third time at the end of the month and the next month. And I uh, found this website, it.com, and it has like 180 mark questions and i recognize five of them from the, from the exam but there's like four different exams so wow. you never know which exam you're going to get i saw oh. that one too oh you were the one that was that 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 yeah what is it hold on let me uh, let me mm -hmm. let me stop streaming let me stop streaming hold on all right go ahead mm -hmm. 